I see we have our councilman here as well. Excellent. Uh, I don't know how I did it, but I crashed Zoom, so I'll be right back. OK. Hey, Chuck. Hi. Here? We're here. And where are you, Chuck? Are you home yet? Yes. You don't I'm back. Hey, you don't recognize his Zoom background? I, I didn't get to see it yet. Hope you had a nice trip. Yeah, great trip. Um, do we wait a couple of minutes, see if... Uh, yeah, we should. And and we have um, Ben Kalos here, so right. maybe we should right. move up the bike item. Sure. I was just saying, howdy neighbor. Yeah. Fun fact, I am neighbors with somebody on community board eight now. Just one? Somebody. Just one person. But I haven't seen them in the elevator yet. No, haven't. <laughs> Uh, chairs and uh, district manager, if I can have screen share capability. You will. Give me one second. Yes, Will can do that. <clears throat> I can. <coughs> you should have it now. Can we get started, uh, Craig? I think so. Yeah, but let's, let's get rolling. Okay. Why don't we call the meeting to order? This is the December meeting of the Transportation Committee of Community Board 8. I'm Chuck Warren, the co-chair, Craig Later, my co-chair. And um, why, don't we, why don't we get started? Will, do you want to make a few introductory announcements as you always do? Of course. So welcome everyone. Um, if you're joining us for your first time at one of our virtual committee meetings, you'll notice that you're muted and you're going to stay muted throughout the entirety of the meeting, except for whenever uh, either the committee co-chairs, Chuck Warren or Craig Later, call on you. So following each discussion item and presentation, the co-chairs will call on members of the public who wish to speak. You can participate by going to the reactions icon at the bottom of your screen and pressing the raise hand button. It's not the thumbs up or the wave, those will disappear. Only press it once. If you press it a second time, your hand will go back down. If you're on the phone, it's star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. Be on the lookout for a prompt asking you to confirm unmuting once the co-chairs call on you. And uh, if you're having any problems with Zoom, you can always use the chat. The chat is only available for technical support with Zoom software. It is not to ask questions or make comments to the co-chairs. They will never see those chats. If you're using an older version of Zoom, you'll need to go to the participants section where you'll find the raise hand feature there. And finally, we ask that you do not raise your actual hand or wave at the screen because we might not be able to see you. So just chat me if you're having any problems. Good. Thank you, Will. Um, we're happy to see our council member, Ben Kalos, here. And um, since he is here, we have uh, uh, item five, which is discussion of potential future protected bike lanes and corridor, opp corridor opportunities to community board eight. And Ben has been something that he cares about. And 
And we thought uh, we asked him if he could show up and he kindly agreed. And so I'm happy to turn things over to Ben for, and I, I think you can share the screen now. I uh, will probably set that up. And why don't you go ahead, uh, Ben? Uh, first, I wanna say thank you to uh, Craig and Chuck. Uh, Chuck's been fighting for our environment since long before uh, I was on community board eight long before I was an elected <laughs> official, long before a league of conservation voters uh, in his role at the EPA. And uh, I, I have to say that fighting to reduce people's carbon footprints and create a, a sustainable uh, way to get people from place to place without polluting the environment is not easy. Uh, and it is not a, a fun job to, to be co-chair of a committee that is, is doing hard work and getting uh, a lot of emotional reaction from people. But I want to thank Chuck for his service for, for, for as long as I've been in politics, Chuck has, and he's been on Community Board 8 fighting for this and has not been getting compensated for it. So I want to thank him. I also want to thank Craig. Uh, one of the reasons I appointed Craig to Community Board 8 is because he is a transportation planner. He does do this for a living, and we are getting free urban planning from him. And his family is not, ang it, it, it's, I, his family understands this is a passion, and that's why he is not free uh, for, for several evenings a month. But um, I'm very grateful to, to both of them for doing this. And so when uh, folks reached out and said, what, what's left to do? I uh, figured, why not, why not share some of the things that folks may not even know about because it wasn't necessarily public. So just gonna share a letter that uh, actually got sent August 25th, 2015. Um, this was sent to Polly Trottenberg, who is now Deputy Secretary for Transportation. And so we said, what if we had a 67th cross town pair, a 70s cross town pair and an 80s cross town pair? And so we laid out a case for the different crosstown pairs. Um, we ended up getting the 77th, 78th Street crosstown pair. Uh, in lieu of the 67th, 68th Street crosstown pair, we ended up getting the 61st, 62nd. Uh, this community board was actually the uh, instance of first impression. We also got the Second Avenue bike lane, which is mostly protected, which is an opportunity. Um, and so this was, the map in 2015. And as you can see, there's a crosstown lane on 106, there's a crosstown lane on 91st and 90th, and that's it. And so here was the city bike expansion. We tried to tie the uh, roads to that. And so one thing I guess I would share is that we still don't have a crosstown pair in the 80s. And I believe that a large blocker for that was actually Governor Cuomo at the time, the, the junior, not this senior. Uh, that is not supposed to be on the internet. Sorry about that. Um, everyone knows where my heart is now. Uh, so please don't share that. That was definitely by mistake. Anyway, um, so I wanna just share on Google Maps, uh, if you're looking at 85th Street, what you will notice is that um, you can actually use the measure tool. It's about 30 feet wide. It's actually wider than most streets. Um, and if you drop the little gentleman here on 85th Street, uh, you can see that there's actually particularly a, a lot of room on this street uh, for uh, bike lanes. Same thing for 84th. And this actually continues throughout. It's just one of the, the wider side streets, wider than, than most. So. I wanted to put that on um, folks' radar for something that was considered. It was heard. I don't know how many times you've had hearings on 84th, 85th, but without Governor Cuomo to block it personally and intervene on a specific block, 84th, 85th uh, would be a uh, good location. And I know some people have said, I don't want to live on a uh, street with a, a, a bike lane, uh, but I will say that uh, Chuck has lived on a street with a bike lane for many years. And one of the reasons I chose this block was because it had a, a bike lane where I could pull right up to it in my bike. So um, the other opportunity, which you will be hearing, uh, I don't know, uh, Craig, have you ever, Craig, Chuck, have you already voted on the Park Avenue bike lanes? No, we haven't heard no. um, any requests. So 
Park Park Avenue is going to be redone uh, (laughs) because basically underneath Park Avenue is the uh, train uh, to Grant Central. And so they have to basically remove the park from Park Avenue from the top of the street in order to restore that roof. And in so doing, DOT put forward a plan, which I have seen, which Community Board H had asked to see, uh, for there to be basically a pedestrian mall in the middle of Park Avenue. And so you'd still have planters on either side, but you'd have a mall, you'd have a bikeway on both sides. Um, And I think that uh, that would be great. We have First Avenue, we have Second Avenue. Um, One of the complaints I still hear all the time is that where you have the bike lanes, you do have bikes. Sometimes they, I think, I'm not seeing as many people going the wrong way on the bike lanes now. I think the bike lanes are fairly saturated with traffic, particularly during rush hour, which I would say anytime people are getting deliveries. Uh, So I don't see people going the wrong way as much as they used to, because frankly, there just isn't room. Uh, I do know that on (laughs) Third Avenue, uh, we're seeing folks on both sides of the street and Third Avenue could likely benefit from a protected bike lane. It is certainly wide enough. Uh, Lexington could also, and, and just frankly, just, I don't see why we couldn't have the infrastructure on every avenue to keep people safe. So uh, I've only got about 30 days left, but um, I just want to say I fully support the co-chairs of this committee and all the great work folks have been doing to expand the safe infrastructure for people to, to cycle, because at the end of the day, um, you have an amazing power here. Uh, if you live on the Upper East Side, um, down. there are folks all over the city who are dealing with gun violence, but that's not the violence we deal with. The violence we deal with is traffic violence, where you are more likely to be killed by a vehicle than pretty much anything else. And um, I firmly believe in urban planners like Craig and co-chairs like Chuck and all of you on this board and your ability to say, you know what, we can design better streets where pedestrians have a place, where cyclists have a place, and where cars have a place. And the only other challenge I'll throw to you, because I don't have the answer on it, is where do micro-mobility vehicles go? Where do the uh, hoverboards, the uh, 20 mile per hour scooters, and the e-cycles go? Because pedestrians go about four to six miles an hour. Uh, Bikes, generally go six to 12 miles an hour, especially if it's me pedaling a city bike and maybe I need to be in better shape. But then the the electric assist vehicles are going about 15 to 20 miles an hour. And so you you, you end up having the speeds doubling each place. So pedestrians are going a certain speed and then bikes are going twice as fast. And then the vehicles are going twice as fast and the cars are going twice as fast and velocity plus mass uh, creates the impact that actually hurts us. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you want to say anything else, but uh, I think uh, just so we'd like to thank you for all your years of service to the community up here. You've been indefatigable in uh, supporting all kinds of things and, and all over the district and did a lot of really good things. And we, um, we appreciate, as a, you're, I know you were on this board, I remember it well, and uh, I'm sure you'll be continue to be active in the community and we wish you well. And I also want to extend the same sentiments. You've really um, brought a lot to our community in terms of especially transportation and and improving safety for all users of our system. Um, You've definitely done a tremendous amount of work and have been up front and center on citywide issues and and all of your in-person events that you hold here with everyone shows your dedication and i think we all greatly um, appreciate and want to thank you for all of your service and and i'm sure i'll see you in the elevator at some point here (laughs) okay um Item number one on our agenda is 205 East 92nd Street, the Eastern, and that's a request for a no parking sign in front of the front entrance of the building. And I should say, before we talk about this, that uh, our committee and our board has generally had a policy that we don't support these kinds of things because we're concerned about 
the precedent and about a lot of other people wanting to do it and pointing to this building has it, why can't we have it? I mean, there, <clears throat> we, we do it for institutions and we do it, you know, when, when there's a special circumstance way beyond, you know, but it's very rare that we do it and, and, and we have a, a precedent uh, and a policy against it. So with that, do we have someone here um, for the applicant to talk about the application? Uh, yes, we do. Daniel, you can go ahead and unmute. Uh, um, I am. Okay, go ahead, Daniel. Uh, uh, no, as, a, as an avid cyclist who lives on the Upper East Side, I hope we do have uh, additional um, you know, bike lanes uh, in, in the coming years. Uh, but Chuck, to address your question, so I, I'm a resident of the East, and it's a 231-unit apartment building located at 205 right. East 22nd Street. Um, and first, I'd like to thank uh, the members of the CBA Transportation Committee for their time and the opportunity to speak this evening regarding my request for a no parking restriction in front of the East End. And I'd also like to thank uh, District Manager Will Brightbill for his assistance. He answered a lot of my questions, put the request on the agenda tonight, and provided me with the public notice flyer and associate grid map. So I thought I'd just provide a little brief background regarding my request. So to address a, a pressing safety concern, one that was uh, addressed a little bit earlier tonight, I wrote a letter at the beginning of the year to the New York Department of Transportation with a request for no parking sign to be installed in front of the entrance to the East End. And this is to ensure the safest possible entry, loading and exit unloading of residents, guests and delivery people into and from their vehicles. To those on the committee who may not be familiar with the location of the East End on the north side of East 92nd Street, this is set in a bit from Third Avenue. There's a steep declining grade heading eastbound uh, one way in East 92nd from Third Avenue to Second Ave. So um, passing cars and trucks, they really tend to accelerate rather quickly after making a turning right onto East 92nd Street from northbound Third Avenue or continuing just eastbound on East 92nd Street after going through the intersection at Third Ave. Um, this creates an extremely dangerous situation for anyone getting into or out of their vehicle in front of the East End, especially with uh, elderly residents, with walkers, families, with uh, young children, and strollers. You know, if you try to get out uh, on the right side of the car, it's quite hazardous due to passing vehicles. You can hardly open your door, tags on the left side due to park cars in front of the entrance. And often you can't squeeze between park cars if you have groceries or luggage and hand little and walkers or strollers. Uh, and Chuck, to your point, the, across the street for Yorkville Towers, there is a, a no parking um, area that's been designated that's about four car lengths. Um, so there is, there is precedent there. And uh, in the August reply letter that I received from the Manhattan Borough Commissioner of the New York Department of Transportation, the commissioner noted that the Manhattan Borough Engineering Office completed a preliminary field investigation involving land use and traffic regulations in front of the East End. He had, and I quote, while we do not foresee an issue in fulfilling your request, please note your request is considered a quality of life issue and as such requires approval of Community Board 8. That's why I'm presenting my request tonight. They've asked me to present a signed petition with a majority of the residents of the East End in favor of the parking restriction um, to Community Board 8 and have the board inform us regarding of their decision. So I went through this process and it was quite an undertaking. I've presented Mr. Brightbill with the requested signed petitions from a majority of the apartment units at the East End in favor of a no parking restriction. So that's over 216 units. Uh, through the petition process, I received several notes and post-its from residents in the building thanking me for this request. Uh, the East End doormen are also highly appreciative of the request. They often receive complaints and concerns about the lack of room to enter and exit vehicles safely in front of the building. Uh, building. And I'd say tell only one resident um, on the 17th floor noted on her petition, and I quote, agree, it is a huge safety concern. I have an infant, and I'm concerned every time I have to put the baby in the car seat. It is extremely dangerous as cars and trucks try to squeeze by. Um, as requested, I posted bright copies of the public notice seven days in advance of tonight's community meeting on 48 light poles and street light poles, both sides of the streets and the surrounding area. This is from the southwest corner of East 91st and 3rd Avenue to the northwest corner of East 93rd and 3rd Avenue to the north, northeast corner of 93rd and 2nd Ave to the southeast corner of East 91st and 2nd Ave, as well as both sides of the cross streets of East 93rd, East 92nd, and East 91st between 2nd and 3rd uh, Avenue. Uh, in addition, I provided multiple copies of public notice, the doorman of East End, the Yorkville Towers, which is just right across the street. 
south of the building at the East End, the Knickerbocker Plaza, just south of Yorkville Towers on East 92nd and Rupert Yorkville Towers, which is just south of the East End, we're posting in these apartments and condo buildings um, for residents to attend the meeting tonight if interested. I also provided Mr. Brightbill with photos of location of each of the 48 public notices and the requested grid map noting the locations of the notices. So to wrap things up, I kindly requested the Transportation Committee and the full board approve the request for no parking signs be installed in front of the East End um, to address a pressing safety and quality of life concern. Um, thank you for considering this matter. I'm happy to address uh, any questions. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate all your posting. Um, are there any comments from the public first on this and, application. And, and, and while we wait for members of the public to raise their hands, I just want to clarify. So the there is in fact no parking in front of the, um, the building across the street from the entrance of the East. And however, I do want to note that there is a significant difference there in that that no parking area is part of a um, of a of a pull-in area that is separate from the main thoroughfare of 92nd Street. So rather than cars um, being able to pull up to the curbside, they're able to pull further in and it's not, um, it's a very different situation than in front of the Easton where it would be taking an actual parking space as opposed to spaces that are not considered, that, that were specifically constructed for, um, Temper uh, for pull-ins and pull-outs. So I think that is um, an important distinction that people should be aware of. Um, I think we have a couple of people who want to, for the public here, uh, Christine Early, I believe is, is Christine Early here. Christine, you can go ahead and unmute. Yeah, why don't you, Christine, unmute and you can uh, comment. Okay. I Hello, think can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. Okay. All right. Um, my concern um, with this no parking request is like, like it was mentioned, the pullback across the street was only built a few years ago and we lost probably about six parking spots in total because of that. Um, the block itself already has three garages. So we have a problem with that, with entryways going into the buildings for trucks and stuff. And then there's also a, uh, a fair amount, probably about six parking spots that are lost because um, there's no parking allowed there because they have dumpster and garbage pickup. So my question is this no parking request, it's essentially going to be taking away more parking that we've already lost in the neighborhood in addition to what we've lost with the city bikes, et cetera. Um, this, I have no complaints with the city bikes, but I, I, I do have a, a serious concern about the loss of available parking for people. Thank you, Christine. Um, Thank you. Next, Andrew Fine. Is Andrew here? Andrew, you can unmute. Yep, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah you're, um, you're, you're set. I would just say that this seems like a reasonable request People that make a right turn on 72nd Street towards the East End um, would be taken by surprise by double parked cars in front of the East End. And I think they should be granted 20 or 25 feet in front of the East End for unloading and loading right in front of the building. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are, the other, are there any other? There, there's one more. Comments? Yeah, Steve, someone identified as Steve. Steve, just Steve. identify your, your last name. Yeah. As we... Your last name, and then you can unmute. There you go. Last name is K-A-L-L-A-N, Callan. Go ahead, Steve, you're, unmute. You're, you're on. Okay, gentlemen, I've been living on the east side on 92nd Street for the last 40 years. And I can give you a list of parking spots that have been lost on the north side of 92nd Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue, there's a no parking trucks loading and unloading from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., which used to be on the corner of the uh, cor Eura Corner uh, restaurant. Then there's the no standing sign further down the street from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Then further down, almost at the corner, 
There's no standing from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. and 4 to 6 p.m. That's just on the north side of 92nd Street. On the south side of 92nd Street, there's the no parking anytime, which is at the Yorkville, where they basically lost part of their sidewalk. Uh, then there's no parking anytime between the two garages on the south side of the street. On 93rd Street, we recently lost parking to school, which is part of the building of 205 East, but it's on the 93rd Street entrance. There's no parking there from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Saturday, uh, Monday through Friday, correction. City bikes put up approximately 30, 35 bikes in front of Ben Kalos's office. And there's no parking on the north side of 92nd, 93rd Street, almost on the corner of 3rd Avenue. There's a medical building. So as you can see, we probably lost maybe 50 parking spots. That's not counting the amount of parking spots that were lost due to the restaurants now putting um, outdoor cafes, not only on the sidewalk, but taking up street. So you lost metered parking, you lost free parking, and now they want you to lose additional parking. Unfortunately, the building was not smart enough to put a garage in when they built that building. So people have to deal with it. Living in New York City, unfortunately, one of the negative things is dealing with parking. I believe that the board should stand by its original um, commitment of not giving out any additional no parking zones. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, are there any other comments from the public? I don't see any. Will, do you see any that I'm not seeing? I don't, but I'll just remind everybody if you would like to comment uh, on this or any <laughs> other item on our agenda, Look for the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and press the raise hand button in that menu. You have a person named Thales and then Andy Rosenthal. Okay. Is it the Thales or Thales? Hi there. Yes, yeah, it's, it's Thales. Um, first time uh, participant. Thanks for uh, taking my question. Um, I was just listening to the comments around the parking. Um, I'm just an FYI, I live on uh, uh, 3rd and 90th. Um, and I, I do have a car, and I do occasionally want to park on the street. I, I park it in, um, on Roosevelt Island uh, for the long term, but uh, every now and again, I need to park on the street as well. And I think that the, the loss of parking is certainly a real concern. I find myself wondering, though, if there is some way that we can find a compromise mechanism that might suit both, uh, both parties. Um, and I, just thinking out loud, uh, background as an architect, I don't obviously have a graphic to look at or a site design, so I, I'm not familiar with these specifics of the circumstance here, but something like, um, you know, speed bumps or um, uh, some sort of a highlighted signage around, you know, careful people crossing or people boarding, what have you, might be able to address the safety concern that was raised and maybe modify some of the driving behavior in the area without necessarily having to take the uh, more draconian measure of, um, you know, uh, eliminating parking spots. That's really just my comment. Is there, an, is there potentially an alternate way rather than either this or that, if there's some other sort of um, meet in the middle way to modify behavior? Thank you. Uh, there are, I would note there are, we do have some streets, not, you know, on the Upper East Side, not that far from this site that do, do have like speed humps in there. They call them speed humps, I guess. And um, for a long time, the Department of Transportation would not entertain them. But they do now, and that's certainly something to look at if that's a problem. The 92nd Street is a street where people do turn, and they can get on the FDR, you know, north or south. Um, Andy Andy Rosenthal is next. Can we unmute Andy? Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. I would like to speak in support. I used to live at 93rd and 3rd, and now down uh, further south at 78th Street. Um, this request just seems so, so reasonable to me. The number one priority of the community board and all our elected should be to preserve life. That should take precedence over everything, preserving life. And that's what this request could do. We've had 112 pedestrians killed on the city streets so far this year. And the numbers are rising, okay? So 
this seems just so reasonable. There are 216 units with my guess is 400 plus people who would benefit from this. And we're giving up parking for what, two cars? It just seems like this is a no brainer to me. And I would ask the committee to vote to preserve life, to vote to, to increase the quality of life for the majority of the residents of New York. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any further members of the public. Why don't we go to the board and uh, Michelle Bernbach. Michelle, uh, you can unmute. unmute Michelle. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, Daniel, I sympathize and I appreciate everything you've said, <clears throat> but um, to be clear, this is an issue with practically every apartment building in the city of New York. And for all the reasons stated, there's a reason that the committee has had um, uh, the precedent that it had that Chuck outlined before we heard this. This problem is not unique to your building. Um, that's not to minimize your concern, but it's the same concern that people have in every apartment building all over the city. So I would recommend to our committee and to the board to not permit this to go forward. And if you wanted to look at something like a speed bump, I would have to look at the site and Colleen is on this call. And if the committee wants to ask for that, I wouldn't pose an objection, um, but it would have to slow down and not haul traffic because that is a street that does go to the drive and um, and also further down, it has a bus. But in terms of your request tonight, I would strongly recommend that we not we not go forward with it. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, next is uh, Rit Agarwala. Rit, why don't we unmute Rit? Thanks, Chuck. Um, I'd, uh, I'd I'd take the opposite perspective. I think this is a very thoughtful proposal. I think it makes sense. Um, and actually I take the reasons that Michelle pointed out. Uh, I take the opposite lesson. This is a pervasive problem. Um, and it's a problem not only for safety, but it's a problem for all of those apartment buildings where we see people constantly having to double park in order to load and unload. And whether it's taxis or, or Ubers or private vehicles or whatever, um, it creates both a hassle and a, uh, and a safety issue. And I think this board really needs to seriously consider the unrepresentativeness that it projects when we say that it's more important to preserve two parking spaces than to help several hundred of several hundred CB8 residents from having an easy and safe ingress and egress from their apartment. Um, so I think not only should we overturn our past precedent, which doesn't make any sense to me since it does not actually serve the pressing need, the daily need of most of our, our neighbors. But I'd also like to move that we support this uh, request. Okay. Um, is there a second to that motion that we support the request? No, I know, I know what you're saying. He's not supposed to not supposed to make a motion uh, while you're speaking. You're supposed to, you know, you have to do that separately. But I don't know. Is is there any is there any kind of a second from any board member? Well, just use the thumbs up feature if you're wanting to second. I know those are hands up to be talk. Is there any kind of a second there? I don't. I don't see a second. I think Rita, Rita just seconded. Oh, Rita did. Yeah. Oh, Rita seconded. Okay, so Rita seconded. So we'll we'll discuss. We'll discuss it, obviously. So um, Elaine Walsh is next, I think. Oh, okay. Thank you. I want to agree with everything that Michelle said. Indeed, if we set a precedent for this building, I guarantee you, can you hear me, Chuck? You seem to be- Yes, not yes, yes. No, no, I can hear. Yeah, you're okay. fine. <laughs> that every other building, including the one I live in, will request this and therefore we will have major issues in the city. You're requesting a no standing or a no parking. I can't remember. No, no, par they, no parking. A no, no parking because the no standing they could not do. 
But who's going to enforce that that space is kept clear for quote, residents only to unload and load and not have commercial or other vehicles go in there. I have a disabled partner. I understand, I have a car. I live with the challenge. But for every building to have a space is not real. And that's what will happen. And I understand it, but when people moved into that building, they knew what the block they were moving to. They should have known what the congestion was and made a decision. I'm sorry that there's a hassle with carriages, deliveries, et cetera, but every other building has it. And I will not support uh, uh, agreeing to a no parking in front of that building. And in fact, you do that and the disabled New York City drivers who have this New York City label will park there because that will give them two spaces for themselves. Thank you, Elaine. I see we do have Paul Crickler, a member of the public. Why don't we let Paul comment? I'm gonna save. There are some other members of the public who've already spoken, but we'll, we'll save them and let the other board members talk Thank you, after Chuck. that. Paul, Paul hasn't talked him. Yeah, hi, Paul. Thank you. So I, I missed the earlier bit when I should have spoken. So thank you very much, Chuck. That's okay, sure. This uh, community board, like every other CB, is supposed to represent the interests of the residents. The word represent is key. 80% of the residents of this community board, if it follows the rest of Manhattan, do not own cars. 20% do. It's time to represent the people who live here, not the 20% of people who want more convenient parking that has all sorts of horrible things that come from it. Safety, climate change, and I won't go through all that stuff now. Three or four people have said it so magically. Uh, it's a very simple equation. Two parking spaces for making at least 400 lives safer, if not countless other lives. And the lady who just said, the problem with this is we worry that if this building gets one, everybody else will ask for one. Brilliant. Bring it on. That's how you represent the community. Thank you very much, Chuck. Thank you, Paul. Um, okay, Rita Popper is next. Rita. This is my street. Uh, I uh, had a car up until a year ago. It is a very messy situation with entrances on both sides to very large buildings. Uh, I don't, there is um, a spot on the eastern side of the street, right around the corner from Third Avenue that for a whole uh, car length, a large car length, there is no standing, no parking, no anything. So. I think that if we readjust some of the, uh, put a little bit down uh, further and a little bit up further, that there is plenty of room to have two parking, two spaces for no standing, only for deploying and getting people in and out of their car. And the reason I say that is that I had to pay for parking for 20 some odd years. And we have those gar garages on either side. If you wanna park your car, you have to pay for it. Uh, but if you wanna unload, there is no reason that we don't try to accommodate this. Thank you. you know, what I understand you said there was that there's a no standing zone up a little bit and you're talking about ex Spanning that no standing zone. So that's as opposed to having a no parking in front of the building. Yeah, we could just push up. I mean, it's a, a, so many people have parked in that spot and received a ticket. Uh, so we, if we could change the sign that uh, of where you can, I mean, it, it's a very, it's a strange street. Uh, 
if you look at one sign, it says no parking, uh, whatever the alternate side of the street mm -hmm. is. And then the other one is no parking. So everybody gets a ticket. <laughs> and I mean, it, I, I know it sounds foolish, but it is hard to turn in into that street at night when people are unloading for the Eastern and there is a curb cut on the right side for um, the towers. Yeah, that, Yorkville, Yorkville, I guess, towers. Yeah, yeah. Yorkville towers. <clears throat> that curb cut was in the works for so long and they waited so many years for it. But there is a way that we can push a little in each direction and come up with uh, enough room for people to safely uh, put children in cars and so on and so forth. That, that's my suggestion. Thank you, Rita. I mean, maybe something we can look at. Craig, I know you want to make a comment. Too. Yeah, and, and I raised my hand because I'm going to, as I, as best I could, virtually step aside as chair and make my own personal comments. And I say this um, with all due respect to Chuck, who I almost always agree with, but when we were talking <laughs> about this item before, I mentioned that we had talked about the precedent and I mentioned that I may actually um, decide to go against the precedent. And it's for the same reasons that Rit and Paul um, had spoken about. I've been talking for many years at this point about the need to provide dedicated space for deliveries and drop-offs and pickups of both people and goods. And I think we should be ha we should have some sort of loading zone on every street, on every block in some capacity. Now, clearly there are gonna be some streets where you have different situations than others. And my thought is that maybe we need to come up with some hierarchy to determine which buildings we should be granting requests such as what the Easton is asking for um, based off of the unique situation. So for example, if a building has a driveway, they probably don't need a no, a no parking um, zone or space dedicated for pickups and drop-offs of people in front of their building. But if you have a building that's large enough then and doesn't have a driveway, then certainly that may very well be appropriate. If And while we can't obviously say every building um, would perhaps be able to be granted one, I think it goes along with the broader perspective of how do we make sure that on each and every block, people on ideally each side of the street have the ability to be able to access the curbside and be able to be safely dropped off without having to um, <clears throat> having to have the vehicle double park. So I'm still deciding how I'm going to vote in this situation, but I'm seriously thinking that we it's about time that we start to think holistically about how we um, deal with drop off and pick up um, activity for all of the residents of all the buildings in in our district and whether that means perhaps granting no parking when requested maybe we should be going in that direction so i am now done and i am now back as coach <laughs> okay well uh, if i can step aside for just a minute to, to the only comment that i would make on that is that it's a it's a situation it's, the problem that we have in our community is that we have people of uh, differing economic levels. And um, I don't own a car, but if I owned a car, I'd put it in a garage and I can certainly afford to put it in a garage. But there are a lot of people who do own a car and need a car and they can't afford to put it in a garage. And so then, if, you know, the concern I have, if we then do away with uh, so, you know, a lot of parking spaces on the Upper East Side, uh, which could conceivably be a result of granting these kinds of requests uh, that a lot of people won't be able to, you know, have a car and they, and they won't necessarily be able to get around in, in the, in, and they need a car. They won't, they won't be able to get around in a bicycle and as some people can uh, for their jobs. So I think it's a, I, I have a concern uh, uh, for people who can't afford necessarily to pay for, garages, even though I'm my own personal predilection 
as someone who's been, I want to see less cars in Manhattan and, and, and that, that's just my own personal view, but you're never going to do away with cars. Hopefully there'll be electric cars, but, uh, but people are going to need some place to put them. And there's fewer and fewer places to put them, I think. Uh, and so that's a good, that, so that's one of my major concerns about it, but let's, I'll step back. I'll step into my co-chair role again and see if we have anybody. Uh, I think everybody has spoken, but we can have a few I, I comments. Think Leah ha Hanlon has not. Oh, Leah. Okay, you're you're right. Thank you. Why don't we recognize Sorry Leah Hanlon, that. who has not spoken? And Hi. Thank you very yeah, much. Go ahead, Leah. I I wasn't going to raise this point, but um, I have a really really old car, which I sometimes bring into the city to park when I'm going through some period that I need it. And um, I have on more than one occasion been threatened by doormen in front of very fancy buildings um, on 79th or park um, because I try to park my very old clunky car in front of their very fancy buildings. I've had them try to call the cops on me, which I thought would have been kind of interesting. I've had them reach into my car. I've had them call me sexist things because their boards have told them not to let people park in front of their building. Um, I find it incredibly elitist. And I, uh, so I, I don't really support the big fancy buildings having their own private little zones in front of their buildings, whether it's because the doormen are trying to do it or whether they come to the board and try to get it to be done officially. I didn't want to get that personal, but these things happen. And, and I think it's elitist. Leah, Leah just a, a word of advice. If uh, the doormen can't do that, if it's a regular parking space, you have a right to park there. And it's, it's, there and they, you don't have to worry about them calling the police because if they did, they're the ones who would be in trouble. So they'll never call the police. I I, I was aware that that was the case, but it, it just you know there are people who would back down in that situation sure. and drive away, sure. and so I I don't support that by any mean <clears throat> by any means. Thank you. Sure. Well, okay. So uh, everyone has spoken, but if if they. Uh, uh, if people keep their comments, you know, relatively brief, um, we can we can have people speak again since we don't have other members. Oh, well, I just saw. Is it? There's a new someone who hasn't spoken. Gail before. Benjamin. Gail Benjamin. Okay. We Hi. Can, yes, go ahead, Gail. Um, I have a car, and I'm fortunate enough in that I can uh, garage it. But it seems to me that to allow space in front of buildings really only benefits one group. And that's the people who live on the avenues like Park Avenue, where there are no, um, where the park, the people who live on Park Avenue. If you go around the city, so many buildings have bicycle, the city bikes in front of them. What are you gonna do in those buildings where there are city bikes? You're gonna remove the city bikes? So uh, to me, you know, we, we, we want to encourage visitors to the city, people from out, uh, outlying areas. Many of them can't afford the garage. We have to leave some place, I think, for these people to park. So as, uh, to my mind, this only benefits those in areas where they're um, like the upper areas like Park Avenue. Um, I, I don't see where it benefits anybody else. And I think as much as um, I, don't, I don't sympathize always with the bike riders, uh, I think they would be up in arms if you tried to take away their bike racks in front of the buildings. We are asking for parking to have this dedicated residential parking space. Okay. All right. We have, I, I guess everyone, now everyone, the hands up that I see now have all spoken before, but we can have a, as I said, if we keep it relatively short uh, why don't we we'll take some further comments salas you wanted to comment uh, yes th thanks very much uh, a couple of thoughts um the, the the notion of the precedent i think it's an interesting thing to consider um if you extend that um eventually you have no parking spots now if that's the desired outcome fine but i think it's probably an impractical one um 
Look, I live on a, in, in a walk-up, and uh, we don't have a designated loading zone for us, um, despite the fact that we have a very tight spot. And when people double park, it's very tight, and it's, it's cumbersome, and, and that's just the nature of uh, city living here, um, on the streets specifically. Um, on the other side of the street, however, there's a, a high-rise, and um, they have a, um, a hydrant in front of them, which, of course, is a, an illegal parking spot. And it serves as a great loading zone for them. And so they don't need a loading zone specifically. And I wonder if there's some, back to the sort of hierarchical uh, framework of um, sort of the more holistic consideration of the block, um, maybe we want to factor in things like uh, uh, presence or proximity to uh, fire hydrants uh, to consider sort of the um, propriety of uh, a, a dedicated no parking spot. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, Andrew Fott, well, is there anybody? No, someone who hasn't spoken before, Evelyn David, who's been a... Evelyn. Evelyn? Hi. Star six. Okay. Hi, good I, I did it. Hi, how are you? I hope everybody's fine. I've been listening to this and my heart is sinking. It's so hard to find a parking spot. Um, and, and as far as parking in front of doorman buildings, I know I really try to give them space just to avoid the problem that you guys are talking about with unloading. The, the other thing is double parking in front of buildings. It's kind of accepted. Somebody stops, they, people get out, they unload, and the car drives off. It doesn't stay there forever. I mean, I, I don't know. Am I getting used to city parking and city ways? I guess so. I'm trying to be patient and, and just... As long as everybody's got a space, you know, but, but this is sounding more and more like let's, okay, let's, now we're going to take the spaces away in front of doormen, in front of the buildings. That would be just incredible because I, I can count. So with congestion pricing coming, that's another thing. Okay. So every available inch in the city is going to be taken. I mean, you, you know, I don't know. I, I hope that you don't make a ruling about this. I know on 62nd Street, they put the signs back to no parking from 8 a.m. in the morning until 7 p.m. at night. That's fine. Oh, it's commercial parking. But they took the street and they divided it in half. So on the east south side of 62nd Street, only half of it is for parking at, at any time for anybody. The other half is for nobody standing, nobody parking. We can't figure out why they did that. I mean, if you want to leave a lane so people can go to the right to make a right-hand turn, I understand, but half the street. So little by little, anybody doing anything becomes momentous is what I'm trying to say. It doesn't just stop at one place. It, it just grows and it becomes a nightmare. Even, you know, it's already a nightmare. You guys. <laughs> anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank but Thank you. you very much. I'm glad that the discussion is going on. Thank you. Okay. Ellen. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah. And uh, Andrew Fine for a short comment. Be real quick. In light of uh, the the last commenter and Michelle and Elaine's um, arguments, I I've changed my and reversed my opinion. I think it is a dangerous precedent, and just thinking uh, about having every single uh, building with over a few units having dedicated parking would just be a slippery slope and a complete disaster. So um, I, I reverse my opinion. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Andrew. Um, okay, Christi I'm gonna let Rita have the last word. Uh, Christine Early, uh, next. Christine. I accidentally muted you again. Try that again. Christine, just go ahead and unmute again. There you go. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Christine. Go ahead. Okay, terrific. Um, I just want to thank you for allowing me to speak again. Um, I, I wanted to clarify, I've lived in the building next door to the Easton for 25 years. Uh, my concern with the community board, again, opening up this can of worms for a high-end building, this is a slippery slope for everyone. I agree with Lee and, and, and a few others that have mentioned this, that it does come across as elitist, and the community board should really create a process for reviewing these requests in advance of these meetings, rather than making the residents of East 92nd Street the guinea pigs for this idea. 
Um, the conditions of the street have only become more congested because of the construction of the Easton. Nothing else on the street has changed. This is a situation that the building was aware of prior to the design and construction of the building. People who chose to reside in the building weren't surprised by the status of the street because it's been that way since they've moved in. Ultimately, I hope that you will consider the fact that granting a no parking request for a high-end building will just create, again, a slippery slope, and it will open a can of worms for every other building to request the same throughout the city. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Tricia hasn't spoken before, so why don't we go to Tricia. Show me more. <clears throat> Hi, Hi, everybody. I, I hope you don't hear my son's toys in the background, um, but I will speak loudly <laughs> so I'll drown it out. Um, I, my, my question actually, so I really am appreciative of, of the last speaker and trying to figure out, um, where I fall on this. I, I would, I, I think I agree that in general, um, that there should be a little bit more of a, a process or at least a firmer ground where, where I understand where the community board stands on this besides precedent. I would love us to think about to Craig's point. Um, how we deal with the new challenges that our streets are facing with regards to this. I'd like us to, to see us think through this a little bit more. Um, I, I guess I'm still trying to, I don't know, I'm trying to, to, to figure out where, I, where I'm at with this one, but I, I do think that it's, I, I don't like the idea of us making a decision on this one and then, it, and then, and then from there, you know, everything else kind of, kind of um, either stays the same or we still have the same problems. So I, I kind of, I like the idea of setting up a, a kind of more formalized process or a better way of thinking about this holistically. Okay, thank you. I mean, are you suggesting we set this aside and uh, come up with a process? I don't know, I wanna hear what Rit says because I trust, I'm looking at Rit and Craig and trying to figure out what the planners are are advising on this one. <laughs> okay, all right, let's uh, let's go to Rita. She's been, I've been, go ahead. I was, just gonna, I was just gonna call the question. <laughs> okay, all right, um, I, I see Michelle. Is there a second to calling the question? Yes, Michelle, calling the question, okay. So the, qu the question is called, and uh, why don't we vote? This is vote on a motion to uh, approve this application. So um, maybe on this, uh, Craig, you ought to call the roll so we can, uh, if you have everybody who's here. Sure, I'll just go down the list, um, assuming yeah. that everyone- And if we missed anybody, we can uh, come back. They can speak up. Okay, so, um, I guess I'm on the top, so I'm a yes, Chuck. No. You're a no. Um, Alita? No. Elaine? No. Um, John Phillips? Uh, no. <laughs> Michelle? No. Rita? No. Ritz? Yes. Russell? Yes. <clears throat> Trisha? I'm going to abstain from this one. And Peter? And he's further down the list. Yep, yep. He left and came back. Sorry, Peter, go ahead. Thanks. Thank you. I'm actually also going to abstain. I just want to say, I think this is maybe not a terrible idea, but we should probably discuss this. Uh, Peter, Peter, okay, understood. Peter. Abstain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So that is there anyone anyone that we missed? Raise your hand if we missed you. If you're a board member. Not seeing anyone. So that motion fails three yeses, six noes, two abstentions. Okay. Um, any any further action? I guess we, we can, uh, we'll have to report something to the Department of Transportation. Michelle, mm -hmm. Michelle, 
uh, why don't we recognize it, In that case, is it appropriate to make a motion to disapprove? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, we probably should have that and get it to the full board. <clears throat> if that's what the majority comes out with. So if someone wants to make that motion, you can. Uh... I did. I just made. Oh, that oh you just made it. <laughs> Is there a second to that motion then? Yeah, thumbs up from somebody if you're seconding it. Okay. John Phillips. Okay. Um, is there any, I mean, further discussion or do we want to just vote on this now? Yes. Tricia, do you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, you know, I was so just thinking this through a little bit. I, I'm still going to abstain from this one. I think I will give it more thought before our full board meeting, but I, I do stand by my original, my earlier statement. I think that the, the that we should have a more thoughtful process and how we deal with this problem going forward. It's a big, it's a problem that we will face. I know we faced it in the past, but I, I am, I'm, I, I hear our neighbors who are telling us that this is a problem that we can no longer ignore or just say that this is part of city life. Um, so I, I appreciate that. And I wish that we would be able to, to talk about this in a, in a kind of, in a broader, broader sense. So I, I, if that's, sorry, um, I, I think that if we, if we can't, if we can't do that tonight, then I will still abstain from this one. And I will think about whether or not I'll change my vote by the time the full board comes. But I would ask that the chairs uh, figure out or think sure. about a way that we can that we can talk about this in a larger in a lar in a in a sure. broader sense. And, and and I think I have an idea. So okay. just just to preview something, um, and Chuck, you'll let me know whether you agree. I know we were emailing just before this meeting about some emails that just came in that we were going to bring up under new business. But one of those items includes a list of proposed um, neighborhood loading zones that. New York City DOT is proposing um, following up on meetings and presentations that they had done earlier this year here at this committee. So we are going to aim to um, have that discussion in January and perhaps that would be the time as we're talking about neighborhood loading zones to be able to further elaborate on this discussion and be able to talk more about the holistic vision of how we foresee perhaps um, loading zones, not only those that are formally proposed by New York City DOT, but how we may want to go about future um, inquiries regarding individual buildings and how we may want to attack the issue when thinking about the other aspects of, of the transportation network and, and loading zones that may exist nearby. No, I agree. I think that's a good, that's a good way. To, that's a good thing to take up. Absolutely. Um, Let's see. Trisha, wait, Trisha, did you, you look like you want to say something. Yeah, thank you, Craig. And I look forward to being part of that. I, you know, I just want to, the last piece I'll say is that, you know, when, when other issues of transport under the umbrella of transportation come up, like for instance, like snowmelt systems or things like that, for me, at least, I know what kind of criteria that this community board holds, you know, for what we find acceptable for snowmelt systems. I know what I look at as what's acceptable for snowmelt systems. And I'm able to pretty quickly check off those things. And if they are acceptable, then it's an easy thing for me to support. I wish that we could get to a place where we're thinking about this issue in a way where I'm, where I know, you know, if, if there are so many other, if, if there's another, if there's an available parking in, in this many spots, or if it's this big of a building or if, you know, whatever, or if there's a loading zone that's within 10 feet or 20 feet or whatever it is, you know, if we can start to think about it that way, then I think it would be helpful because then at least selfishly, I would at least have a guide for what our board is thinking about holistically with this issue. Um, and I, and I think that that, that's all I'm going to say on that. Sure. Well, we can certainly look at that, Trisha. Uh, Peter Bork, I know he wanted to speak while he was voting. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I, for years, have been against this um, for two reasons. One is that's just that's been our policy. And two, I just I, we've been taking away a lot of parking spots and I have a car. And so it's been extremely difficult to park. I think at some point, though, it, it does behoove us to actually start to rethink this. However, I think I, I agree with, with what Tricia said and um, with what Craig said. I, I think we should do this in a more holistic view. Don't think it makes sense to just kind of haphazardly approve this on a kind of one-off basis for the first go. I think we should probably think about 
what types of buildings under what circumstances we actually would want to implement this. At some point, though, living in New York City has just become really, really, really hard. And we, we have to do what we can to, to try and make it easier. And if there's a huge building, it might make sense to actually rethink this. So I, I don't know how we do that, Craig and Chuck, uh, but I, I think we, we should we should kind of rethink this and um, on a go forward basis. We'll figure it out. Craig and I can figure it out. And we'll come I up have with no that. doubt. <laughs> we can do okay. anything. Right. John Phillips. John. Why don't we unmute John? Chuck. Go ahead. Thank you, Chuck. Um, so, yes, I mean, the city is definitely moving in a particular direction, and there's a lot of considerations that we're going to have to really take a look at. Um, one of the guiding kind of uh, events of this meeting is the community's opinion about whether we should opt on the side of pedestrian ease or parking for, you know, citizens of Manhattan who need parking spots for their cars to get to work and conduct their lives. And it's a complicated situation. So given the direction that we're probably going to be moving in, these discussions should probably be had with an eye on the multitude of changes that are probably going to happen, i.e. loading zones, perhaps very large buildings do need a certain um, amount of pedestrian space in front of their buildings. But to do it, I think right now, um, building by building could really result in a lot of confusion and maybe not with the intended consequence that any of us want. Um, and so it, it's very, very important. One of the most compelling things about it that kind of bring me closer to saying yes to something like this is the idea of getting trucks, double and triple park cars closer to the curbs, because I think that impacts everything from cyclists and safety to um, you know, functionality with, um, with regard to how we receive our packages, how businesses receive their goods and, and things like that. So um, this would be a very meaningful discussion and its outcome is gonna impact the city in very big ways. So I just wanted to add my two cents to that and really identify with both sides of this argument on the community front, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you, John. I, I think the idea of loading zones for trucks and stuff is something that has to happen considering the proliferation of trucks and all the deliveries, the, the Amazons and you know the, all of those other services. Um, but appreciate it. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, all the comments are very valuable, um, but we are in the middle of a vote and I'd like to call the oh. question. Oh, okay. Wait, be before we do that, Rick actually had his hand up before the first vote and it was taken down during the vote. So can we just give him a chance to make his comments? Sure. And then we'll yeah, I, with, then, we'll, then, we'll, then we'll vote, Michelle. So, I, you know, you all know how I feel both about this specific and the general. I think the idea of developing a, a process and a set of criteria is really thoughtful. I think we should do that. Um, there should be a systematic way by which we do this. And I think... The idea that we're just going to say no and frankly stick our fingers in our ears um, in the face of what people both on both sides of this have said is basically overwhelming demand for this kind of change. Uh, I think it's unrealistic. I'll, I'll point out, I hope the residents of this building actually petition our new borough president to join the community board um, because you've demonstrated a lot of great uh, local activism and I, I think we should commend you for that. And I will point out that while I, you know, we obviously we lost the, I lost the vote on, on the motion to support, the idea of putting this into a process, number one, does require ensuring that we understand the actual demand. So the quote unquote, opening the floodgates, it, we can do it through a process rather than in a haphazard way, but we have to make sure that we actually seek it out. Um, and I also think that is a good reason not to disapprove this. It may be fine that we want to say, we're going to postpone this and put it first in the queue for analysis once we have our criteria, but to disapprove this now, actually, I think sends the wrong uh, message. I guess the problem was the, the Department of Transportation, you know, we have, a, we have an action before us. I understand what you're saying, but and they need to have some response from, from us. <laughs> But listen, we'll, we'll let the committee speak on that. Uh, so we, the question's been called, even though we, we informally writ, made a comment anyway. But um, why, don't we, why don't you call the roll? And this is a motion to disapprove. 
Great. Yeah, so I'll start. I'm a no. Chuck? Yes. Alita? Yes. Elaine? Yes. John? Yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry. This is not a very efficient process. Sorry. Yeah. Will un unmuted me for a second, so that was the cause of the delay. Um, John, I'm sorry, what was your vote? Oh, John. I vote yes to disapprove. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michelle? Yes. Peter? Abstain. Rita? Rita, unmute. Yes. Russell? No. Trisha? Abstain. And Ritz? Um, you do have Barry Schneider here. I don't know if he's been here long enough to vote. Oh, okay. Um, Ritz, go ahead. No. And I have not been here long enough to vote. Thank you. All right, so that that disapproval passed um, six yes, three no, two abstentions. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. This will uh, come before the full board. And uh, what are we? Two weeks from today. Two yes. weeks from today. The fifteenth of will is it? Right. Yeah. So this is what we report to the full board and appreciate the good discussion that everyone had. I think there are a lot of issues that have been raised, a lot of important things, and we'll proceed to dig into the situation further. Um, okay, item number two, 78th Street and Cherokee Place. This is a request for a stop sign on 78th Street. And do we have anyone here to, uh, speak for the re on the request. Uh, Karen, you can go ahead and unmute. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, Will, if you don't mind at some point sharing uh, the screen, that'd be great. Um, yeah. uh, thanks. <laughs> um, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak with you all this evening. Uh, my name is Karen Spiegel, and I live at 500 East 77th Street near the intersection of Cherokee and E70, Cherokee Place and E78 Street. Um, as a resident in the area, I see firsthand that this is a busy and potentially, <clears throat> excuse me, unsafe intersection. For anyone who may not be familiar, um, you'll see that Cherokee Place intersects E78 Street mid block between York Avenue and the FDR Drive. And thanks Will for putting that up. Um, I believe that a stop sign and pedestrian crosswalk on East 78th Street at Cherokee Place uh, or other traffic, traffic calming measures would significantly benefit pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers alike, and would increase safety and accessibility in this area. As many of you probably know, this is a highly trafficked area given its proximity to John Jay Park and Playground, the ramp to the East River Esplanade and a number of local schools, including PS 158 Elementary School, which is around the corner from this intersection. E 78th Street also serves as a bike lane for bikes coming off the Esplanade ramp mid block at this intersection and proceeding to York Avenue. You can actually see the bike lane in the map. It's the black line that goes along 78th Street. That's the, the Esplanade ramp. Um, moving west from the river and then joining on to 78th Street at that circled area. And that's that's the intersection that we're talking about at Cherokee and 78th. Um, Will, if you don't mind flipping to the next slide, please. Um, I often see pedestrians, including kids walking their own, walking on their own, crossing East 78th Street mid-block, sometimes as a shortcut to get to East End Avenue and Carl Schurz Park via the FDR Drive service road. The alternative, which would be walking down the narrow sidewalk on the south side of East 78th Street and crossing 78th Street at the FDR service road does not seem 
safe either because turning cars are unlikely to expect pedestrians to cross there. There are actually curb cuts on 78th Street west of Cherokee. Uh, I think you might be able to, can't really see it in this picture. I think I have another one that you'd be able to see it in. Um, but uh, there is no crosswalk or stop sign or other pedestrian signage. There was also previously at one point a curb cut on the southeast corner of this intersection. You can actually see that in this picture from last year. This is a Google image from uh, November 2020, but that has been removed. Uh, let's see. Well, if you don't mind going to the next slide, please. This intersection is also challenging for drivers to safely navigate, particularly when making a left turn from uh, Cherokee Place onto East 78th Street. And you can see that white car in the image is doing it. It can be really hard for drivers to see vehicles driving that are driving west towards York Avenue on 78th for a few reasons, including that cars are often parked illegally on the east side of Cherokee, which blocks visibility, and cars that are parked legally on the south side of East 78th Street east of Cherokee can also block visibility. 78th Street is also somewhat uphill from the FDR to York, which contributes to a visibility issue. There is also no indication or signage to vehicles driving on 78th from the FDR service road to York that there is this mid-block intersection or that pedestrians may be crossing or that cyclists may be entering the road in this area from the ramp uh, to the Esplanade. Cars may travel west on 78th Street after deciding not to get on the FDR drive southbound um, and they may not be familiar with local streets and the fact that there is this mid-block intersection, not to mention the nearby park, schools, and bike lane. I often see cars speeding on 78th Street between the service road and York Avenue, and I have witnessed near crashes at this intersection. While I think that a stop sign and pedestrian crosswalk to the east of Cherokee Place would be optimal, I would welcome other traffic calming measures that may be proposed by the committee and the Department of Transportation. Just to note, there is actually an old um, request with the DOT that's I think from, I put in at 2018, which is still active and has not yet been, I don't think there's been any update on that to include a multi-stop uh, stop sign at this intersection. Um, at a minimum, I would hope to see additional signage to indicate to drivers on, on E78th Street that there is this intersection where people, including children, may be crossing and where cyclists may be joining the road in addition to any other safety improvements that might be feasible, such as a speed hump. Thank you very much for considering this proposal and I'm happy to address any questions. I also have a few extra photos of the area that I can share if anyone is interested. Thank you. Um, First, we go to the public. If there are public uh, comments here on this, you have uh, Kate, you have Kathy Corky, and then Andrew Cor Fine. Corkery, Corkery, Corkery. Catherine, why don't we why don't we uh, unmute uh, Catherine? Hi, everyone. It's Kate Corkery. Um, hello, Karen, fellow neighbor. Um, I am complete compliance with this uh, proposal that you have made. Um, I just want to point out that the bike lane has never been painted on 78th Street from York Avenue to the bridge. And uh, Will, I have a couple pictures to show too of the work the DOT did over the summer, starting in April and ended at the end of May. Could you help me with posting those, please? Yeah, give me one second. They'll be up. No. <laughs> does that look right? That does. So um, the, uh, there was a curb cutout that was made uh, right here. If you can go to the one that showed the one that I took a picture of of the curb cutout, go back one. There you go. So that was a curb cutout that was made when the bridge was made, I don't know how many years ago, um, which actually prevented parking to the edge of Cherokee Place. So that curb cut was curb cutout was taken out. And I spoke to the DOT and the DDC when they were there, because I just happened to be home that day. They said they had to take that curb cut out because there wasn't a because the tree was across the street, and that if there's not a crosswalk you can't have a curb cut out. So next picture, Will. 
so the DO, the DDC came ahead after starting in the end of April to uh, take the curb cut out off of the other side of Cherokee Place that the the west the well, I'm, I'm I'm not sorry what, what side and then they put these two curb cutouts in um, with no crosswalk. Uh, Colleen knows all about this. I'm not sure why they put the curd cub outs across the street when there was no crosswalk or stop sign or speed bump put in. Yet again, it was below Cherokee Place that they took the curb cut out. So the frustration of the, cur of the cars not stopping on Cherokee Place and the other cars zooming up Cherokee Place at night and Will, if you could show this one other picture that I had of the traffic that, was, that happened over the summer. For two months, Cherokee Place looked like this when the Con Edison was doing work on the FDR drive and randomly closed the ramp to the drive at night. It was nonstop until three o'clock in the morning. Um, this is a very dangerous curb here. Everyone is rushing, passing, no one stops at this stop sign. So I thank you, Karen, for taking this initiative because I also put something in with the DOT to stop this. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. You're welcome. Um, okay, so Andrew Fine, I guess, wanted to comment also on this. Andrew? Hi, Chuck, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is 100% logical. Uh, I don't know why there would not be a stop sign there. And uh, I think it's no brainer. So fully in support on behalf of the public. Thank you. This, we have Colleen here. I don't know if Colleen wants to comment on anything here because she was mentioned a few times. You still here, Colleen? Yeah, Colleen, you can unmute if you want to. I'm still here. I do recall this. Most of the work was done by DDC, and I did reference that. Um, if there is no stop sign or a traffic signal, we would not paint the roadway to delineate a crosswalk. There needs to be a stop control at that particular location in order for a crosswalk to be at, uh, installed at that site. I know that we do have an active study where we're looking, I think, at a, uh, at a um, stop sign or traffic signal at that particular location and it's submitted i think in 2018 so i will follow up with our signals to the division sign up status you're still studying okay it takes a few years because we have to collect no, no, that i understand i understand there's a there's a chuck berry song i'm still thinking but anyway that's it, that's know, part of the we, line we, and you know the thing is, is that we have other locations as well oh, no i i'm just kidding yeah. I, you know. I know i know <laughs> okay so why don't we go to the board, Michelle? Can we unmute? Yeah, later? so so that was my recollection that we had addressed Cherokee Place with some detail years ago. And in fact, not only recommended uh, a signal control at that intersection, but also recommended a speed bump. So we spent a lot of time addressing this issue at Cherokee Place. And so I think we uh, concur with Karen, there is a need. And um, if it's gonna, you know, it's the old story. Once you say you're doing a study, you can count on it going about four or five years. If we just said casually, can you take a look at that and see what we could do about it, it would have gone much more quickly. What I would like to ask Colleen, just as a matter of process, while the study is being completed, can we, would it be quick to put a sign, you know how on a, um, on a, on uh, old country roads or whatever, there'd be like a black cross showing that a road is coming into another road, you know, something like this. Would it be quick to put that sign in quickly while the study is being completed and a stop sign or whatever you finally decide gets in there. So we have some way of notifying those cars that are coming off the drive that in fact, there's a road feeding in to 78th Street. Could that be done quickly as a mitigation? Is 
Colleen muted? She is. She could unmute, but she may be away from her computer. Oh. But look, Michelle. Oh, we can, okay. Anyway, so that's what, you know, because I, oh, here she is. Colleen's here. Colleen's here. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Michelle, I don't know if that would be a feasible request for us to just randomly put up a sign. We would have to carefully look at that to determine if we can. And I don't know if that such a sign exists in our inventory. Remember, you're talking about Long Island versus New York City. So we have to follow the sign guidelines by the federal manual uniform traffic device. Um, I mean, I, I, I would have to you know, figure out what other signage that we can look at and install in that area. Okay, understood. I'm just looking for something, you know, a little more immediate uh, so that because we've had a thorough discussion of this and I think we're all on the same page. So nobody is denying what what Karen and others are saying that this is a problem. I'm just saying that we have dealt with it. We've made a resolution on it. We had a decision on it. If there's something that can be done in the meantime, while that's being implemented, great. And if not, what can be done to expedite the completion of the research? But, sure, I will uh, definitely follow up on the signal study and I'll see what we can do in terms of signage. Terrific, Michelle, thank you. Listen, we might wanna pass a resolution for a stop sign and a crosswalk too. So maybe that would give them some impetus. Uh, well, I don't know that our original resolution didn't say that. I'm not sure if it, it did. It did call for some you kind of signaling. Craig? I I don't. I'm trying to remember if this is before my time. It called for some kind of signaling at the crosswalk, and it also called for a speed bump. So, uh, well, Colleen, I'm sure I could look up and see what it called for. But um, Will, do you have that handy? I do not. No. I... Can we? If you want to, we can. We can say we affirm our previous resolution. But I don't know that we need a resolution. Maybe we should just write a letter asking that um, that the completion of the study be expedited. Well, why don't we, other people may want to comment. We may want to just hold this in abeyance and see what, if we go back and check that resolution and see what it's like. And if, you know, we could, we could maybe bring something up at the full board uh, if we've, uh, you know, if, if we go back, we may want to reiterate the resolution or, or add some, something to it. I think uh, that's but, a good idea, Chuck. You know, but why don't we, if there's others who want to still comment, Trisha, if you want to, uh, Trisha, yeah, you want this to is my, this is my, uh, uh, we live right around the, right around no. here. We use this, this park all the time. And I'm so glad that Karen uh, brought this up. It's, it's, a, uh, we, you know, and not to reiterate everything that's been said already, because, because mm -hmm. Michelle's right. We talked about this in 2018. I'm a hundred percent on board with, with passing another resolution on this. Um, and, and we can figure out the language between now and the, and the full board, whether or not it's, it's reiterating the past resolution or being specific about it. And if so, I'd like, I, I, that's what I would like to propose. Um, you know, and maybe adding something in there about like in the interim, um, putting in speed bumps or putting in any, any other safety measures that could help uh, calm traffic on the street. I'm thinking about next summer and just how crazy it gets with the pool at John Jay and how many, how many kids cross that street, um, you know, dragging beach towels and things like that across the street. It's just so dangerous. So in my mind, I, I feel like we have, I feel like we have six months before, before we get into a really bad situation again. Um, so I, I would love to pass a resolution reiterating the immediate need for a okay. uh, stop sign and pedestrian crosswalk. Yeah, we can do that. And we can come up with some language and we'll, you know, see it at the full board. If we need to change it, we can change it. So that's, does someone want to move that? For sure, are you doing that? I'm moving it, been... but I see Rita seconding, seconding not to yeah. okay. get a turn. Okay. Can we vote on that? Okay. Is there anybody? Is there anybody opposed? We can say, well, you know, in favor. You don't have to do anything. But is anybody opposed? And raise your hand. So, if you're voting no, abstaining, or not voting for cause, right. please, please raise your hand so we can call on you. Okay. 
seeing none, so we'll have a resolution and we'll work out the language after we'll look, we'll look back at our previous resolution and we'll come up with something we've approved in principle here and we'll see it at the full board. And if we have to change it, we can change it. But, it, but the general thrust is we want to do something at this corner and we thank Karen and, uh, for bringing this up again. Perseverance. She's lived in New York City, obviously. And yes, I can get it on the record for everyone. Let me just make sure that I announce everyone who's currently here as best as I can tell. It's myself, Chuck, Elaine, John, Michelle, Peter, Rita, Russell, Trisha, Ritt, Alita. I know Barry was here, but I don't see him on the list at the moment. Yes, Barry, he, he's, he, uh, okay, I guess he's not. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Item number three is uh, Chick-fil-A, 1536 Third Avenue curbside sidewalk and roadway congestion caused by double parking and delivery tents in the parking lane. I don't know whether, uh, Craig, did you want to uh, um, talk about this a little bit at the beginning, sure, uh, lay out some of these, the what the facts are here that we Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll just provide a little background. So a few meetings ago, I believe it was in October, a member of the public brought up under new business this ongoing issue in front of Chick-fil-A, which is the fact that there are often double and sometimes triple park park vehicles there. And I've, I walk by there every day and I've also noticed that there is a lot of activity that takes place over there. And in, in addition, there seems to be a tent outside. The, the um, restaurant does have a permit for open restaurants um, under open restaurants to have a um, seating area. Um, one of the things that I'm not sure about, my understanding of the open restaurants um, program is that it is meant um, any space that's used in the curbside, which is where these tents are set up, is supposed to be used for the purpose of outdoor dining. And Chick-fil-A is using it as a staging area for its bicycle delivery activity. So when, it's very apparent from walking there and apparently um, Will has received complaints as well about issues there that there is a lot of congestion that's caused there. So Will, if you could just put up some pictures um, and if, I don't know if you got the video that I sent over, I can- Yeah, do you, which do you wanna start with? So the, I might as well start with the, the photos during daylight and then I'll show the video that I took actually just walking home this evening in preparation for this. Okay. Give me one second. I'm gonna have that up. And thank you for doing this because if I tried sharing my screen, I'm afraid my my computer would crash. So, this was actually taken um, the day after Thanksgiving, and you can see here these cars. I took this um, during a light cycle when there wouldn't be moving vehicles except for the the one on. Um, a few of them, but the red car, the white car, and the cars in front of them are all double park vehicles. And you could see on the left, the tent in the, in the curbside parking lane. Uh, if you can move on well to the next one. Um, so this is again, the, the delivery activity that's taking place under these tents in, in this space. And all the cars that you see here, at this point, there are about seven were all cars that were double parked. I don't know if these were just individual um, um, people who were just picking up their food or if these were associated with some of the delivery companies such as DoorDash or Uber Eats. I'm not really sure, but um, that's one of the questions that I was hoping to be clarified. Um, you can move on. Um, I think just a few of, yeah, again, these are all double park vehicles and you could see this also the the, the bikes as well that are over here. Um, you can go on to the next one, please. Yeah, I, again, I think, I think you can clearly see this. And again, these are all vehicles that are in, not even just the first lane, but the second lane. So what it does is, is that it creates a choke point at 86th Street. And now if you could just show the video, um, this video, as I said, I just took it around a few minutes after five o'clock this evening and perfectly exemplifies the safety issues that are and congestion issues that are caused by all the double park parking activity over there. So hopefully- Give me one to second it. to find that on my screen.
Okay. Um, hoping you'll be able to see this. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. I forgot to turn on the sound. Can you see it now? Yes. Great. So these are old vehicles that have to slow down as a result of these double parked vehicles on the left as they're crossing over 86th Street and it causes congestion that increases as the light cycle goes on. You can see cyclists I, that were picking up food moving in the wrong direction. And then this van over here gets stuck as the light is changing because of the double parked vehicles. And now all of a sudden, all the pedestrians are coming in and crossing. And this van is stuck still in the middle of the intersection, unable to move with oncoming vehicles on westbound 86th Street. And you can see here, the van has to wait for pedestrians. It's an extremely unsafe situation that I witnessed here. And these are, I think, the things that we want to try to figure out how we can work together to collaboratively address some of these issues. Here. So that's these are the facts that um, as, as they currently exist. And we are obviously supportive of small businesses and supportive of of um, of open, well, maybe not everyone, but <laughs> of open restaurants. We just want to see what can be done to make sure that we keep everyone safe and that um, Chick-fil-A is able to um, continue to operate and, and be able to conduct its business as best as possible. Uh, let me ask, is there anyone here from Chick-fil-A? Yes, we, well, we do we... have, Jared, you're, you're here from Chick-fil-A? Yes, hello. Um, yes, would you like to care to comment, uh, Jared? Yeah, yeah, of course. Good evening, uh, uh, thanks for the committee for inviting me to be able to speak to this issue. Um, most of you, I don't think I've met in person yet, so I'm sorry we're meeting over Zoom, but uh, I know sometimes with big brands, the way each location runs a little different, but I, I just want you to know that I'm the local franchise operator. So it's my only business, full-time job in the restaurant, my picture's on the wall. You can come by anytime and, and, and say hey to me. Um, uh, Craig, I 100% I agree with everything you said, believe it or not. Um, uh, I think there's two, two pieces of this. Uh, one is the, the double parking. The other one is the outdoor dining um, setup we have. Uh, I'll, let me start with the, the double parking because I think that's an easy, uh, shorter explanation. Um, so that is something that last year, I believe it started during the pandemic. So March and April, May, you know, the area was just, there was nobody outside. There was really little traffic, no one on the streets. And um, folks, you know, started with maybe some police officers and different city workers just parking there. And then over time, people would just park their car, get out, come inside, order at our counter, just. Um, and then I think over the, in, in early on, um, especially we were just telling people like, hey, you, you can't just park there and walk in, like, what are you doing? Um, but over the last, I would say, year, nine months, a year, it's gotten really bad where people just, it's like a free for all. Everyone just parks there. And, um, it's not, I mean, it's not good for all the reasons you mentioned. It's not good for my restaurant personally, because it just makes the whole area seem so chaotic. And as a, as a restaurant person who, who thinks about hospitality, it's the opposite of, of what I want. Um, so it's something that we, I, I don't know even the right channels to go to. I asked some of the, um, the, the officers writing tickets. I think I've seen people writing tickets three times, maybe in the last 18 months. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure, you know, it was one of those things where we had so many regulations inside the restaurant with COVID and social distancing, and I've chosen to focus on that, obviously. Um, we've also done a lot with the sidewalk area. And so the street is one I've, you know, just to be honest, I've had to kind of like let go and, and, and feel like it's a little, I feel a little powerless to that right now. Very open suggestions. Like I want a solution. I do not, I do not like it at all. Um, so in terms of double parking, that's that's maybe my comment there. Very thank you. That's that's very much appreciated. And, and I think the whole intent of this is to try to figure out collectively um, how we can try to improve the situation because we do want to 
help. <laughs> so I guess we can go to um, members of you the public. You want to talk, uh, uh, Jared, did, you said you want to talk about two, oh, two things. Open, the about open restaurants and, also. And the dining, yeah, and the yeah. So let me, let me give you a context on the outdoor dining area. So last year when the city allowed us to uh, file for an outdoor dining permit, we filed for the permit, just, you know, it was restaurants. We're trying to figure out what the heck we're doing. You know, our sales had dropped by more than 50%. And so we, we filed for the permit. We, we decided to go with a more temporary setup with the barricades and the tents as a way to just figure out like, what do, if we're going to build something, what do we even need that to look like? And so very quickly, we realized that the sidewalk was getting so congested with people who were ordering ahead of time and coming to pick it up. And at the time we could only let 10 people into the restaurant. And so there became a big crowd of people on the streets is where it started. Then we lined people up down the block, but they were in front of other restaurants. And just as I just felt disrespectful, you know, restaurants were getting hurt at the time and, and we had people blocking the, the, the few different restaurants next to us. And so we decided to just pull the, the dining set up and allow that as space for people to wait so that people could still walk down the sidewalks um, and not be congested. And so fast forward to earlier this year in the spring, as vaccinations roll out and as some of the social distancing rules eased, um, we had people felt a lot more comfortable coming inside and getting their to-go order. And so we made that move and we really considered um, pulling all that stuff away, going back to normal. But what had happened over the last year is the food delivery app business had just went through the roof. And so um, the, the third party, the courier drivers who come and pick up the food and bring it to you, if you order from DoorDash or Grubhub or Uber Eats or whatever, they were all over the place with their bicycles on the sidewalk. And so I got clipped one day by a, a, a cyclist riding down the sidewalk. And I mean, we have elderly folks all the time coming in front of our restaurant. I feel terrible. So what we decided to do, um, and I, and I, and I don't want them locking up bikes on the tree, the tree beds as well. Cause that's just not, it's just terrible all around. And so since we, um, one other note with this too, is since we, um, I think are pretty quick drivers like to pick up orders from us. So they, um, some of them will just like hang out between 86 and 87, like waiting for an order to come through on their phone and they'll accept it and then come and pick it up. And so what we decided to do was to keep the barricades. Um, we asked this, the, I don't know, we asked the city, I don't know what, what department for a couple of bike racks back in March of 2020 or April of 2020, just hadn't heard anything yet on that. And so we decided to use the barricades we have as a way for people to lock up their bikes to stay off the sidewalk. And so it's not the prettiest and most functional. And I, I completely agree with like, it's not ideal, honestly. Um, but I think in the last few months, we've really driven a hard line with these drivers and made it clear to them like, hey, you know, if, if you want to come here and eat your food, you're going to not be on the sidewalk. And so we put a lot of energy into that, but they've been, we've trained them, you know, they're not our employees, but we trained them and, they, and they've been staying off the sidewalk. And I feel like the sidewalk has been a million times better. Um, and just safer, honestly, in that area. But I, but I, but I agree like long-term, I don't think, you know, honestly, we are not using the outdoor dining permit. I think the way it's maybe originally attended, but also if we pulled that all away right now, I feel like it creates a more chaotic and, and unsafe you know, situation. So I'm open to suggestions. I'm just been trying to figure it out. And, and thank Colin. you for, for describing that. I think that's very helpful for us to understand as well as we try to problem solve. Yeah, Colleen, do you want to comment? Thanks, um, BOT. How are you? Hi, nice to meet you. Um, I just want to say that the whole intent behind the outdoor dining is to help the restaurants get back on their feet. And we want to help all the businesses that we can and be supportive of what they're doing. But right now, the setup that you have is not intended um, for the outdoor dining um, structure or um, the guidelines that we have issued on our DOT's website. Um, it's more chaotic what you have in terms of, you know, double parking and um, having the, the bicycles in the curbside um, parking lane. I know you mentioned that you've submitted a request for bike racks. I think your location would be ideal for a bike corral. And we would very much be supportive of doing something, um, working with you um, on that. It, 
if you um, send me your contact info, I can put you in touch with my colleague, Dennis, and we can see what we can do to install the bike corral for you and uh, in that area. I think that would be more ideal given the circumstances yeah. and your situation is. That would be great. I would love that. Yeah, maybe we can do that. And then we'll, we could figure out how to do something about the double parking if we can, Craig. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's and, and that's an enforcement important. issue largely. From yeah. Right. Right. And it would be great if the community board can send us an administrative letter saying that you're supportive of a bike corral in that location. Sure. We will. That makes sense. Absolutely. Perfect. Um, okay. Further, there's some comments. I know some people who want to make comments before we, um, Andrew Fine, public first, Andrew Fine. Is Andrew Hi, still Andrew. Here? Hi, Chuck. Thank you. Sure. Um, and thank you, Jared. Um, we've had extensive dealings with Jared on East City 6th Street, and he's proven to be just an incredible community member with an open mind, open ears, and, uh, and he's been very uh, proactive in helping us in the community. Just want to read a, uh, a portion of an email that I sent to the community board chair earlier today um, on the issue. <laughs> That the discussion will center around the use of a tent in the parking lane for bike delivery guys and the congestion caused by double and triple parked cars. I'm familiar with the problem as I raised it on Twitter and was quoted extensively on the matter on Patch earlier this year. I think the tent taking up parking space is a reasonable solution to keep the bikers from crowding and blocking the sidewalk. I don't see how this is an issue at a time when similar businesses are building houses in parking lanes, taking up far more space than their frontage. Chick-fil-A could have done the same. On triple park cars, I think it's ridiculous, but no fault of Chick-fil-A. This is an enforcement issue requiring the NYPD and NYPD traffic to actually enforce the law. A larger issue, a larger issue is why everyone is whining, uh, when everyone is whining about congestion, why are we permitting vehicles to deliver single meals in Manhattan? The demand created by food delivery apps is attracting drivers from far-flung states in the South, like Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, and elsewhere. Do these apps really need a car to drive a chicken sandwich a few blocks? Perhaps cars should be banned from such deliveries in Manhattan. I could get behind this. But again, I find it unusual that the one small business is being singled out by the community board when food delivery apps and their drivers are completely out of their control. I would add that Chick-fil-A has been a good neighbor. They have been active in the community, participated regularly with the East 86th Street Association clean team, which by the way, we'll be meeting this Saturday at noon. If anybody's interested, find me, we need volunteers. And uh, they have, uh, they fed our volunteers and they've been voluntary, voluntarily cleaning the problematic area around the corner, totally unrelated to their property, but around the corner at the M86 bus stop, six days a week, several times a day for the last two years. Can you please clarify for me, neighbors and members of the East 86 Association, how we've ended up calling Chick-fil-A specifically and unilaterally onto the carpet. And again, I think as you've seen display this evening that uh, Chick-fil-A ownership is responsive and they have their ears open. And I thank them for being a uh, productive and beneficial member of the community. That's you know. all. Thank Andrew, you. Andrew, uh, I'd like to just point out a couple things. We're not calling anyone on the carpet when we have issues that concern traffic and congestion, and it's related to a particular business. We want to talk to that business and we want to see if there's anything that can be done about it. If, and, if and I can make it. We're, and that's what we're doing here. And uh, so we're not calling anyone on the carpet. We're trying to work in a cooperative way and appreciate your comments. And we're we're already moving towards some solutions here and we'll do something about enforcement also. Thank you, Chuck. I, I appreciate that. And, and just to further my point, because uh, one of the points that Russell made in, in response 
was that uh, he felt that there was some responsibility of Chick-fil-A for the double and triple parking. And I think that is really, um, if, if I ordered on an app to pick up a chicken sandwich at Chick-fil-A, decided to drive there and decided to double park, that, that would be on me. That's not uh, on Chick-fil-A for making a really good sandwich that I can't resist double parking for. Um, and delivery apps that uh, not only deliver uh, uh, for a service fee, they also take a chunk out of the profits right. of the restaurants that are, uh, are, are affected. Uh, I can't see where they're not responsible for themselves rather than the uh, individual small business owner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Paul Crickler is next. Paul? Can we unmute Paul? Yeah, okay. You're on, Paul. Thank you very much, Chuck. I just wanted to say very briefly, Garrett, I wish you all the success uh, in the world with your franchise. A uh, business owner like you is uh, an absolute dream for people who, who live in the community. I have to say double bonus points also because anyone who gets more bike racks for us and just ask for them and tells you're getting it, big win. So thank you very much. The last thing I'll say on a very positive note as well, I just wanted to, I couldn't help thinking, Craig, I know we haven't spoken or met before, but the way you presented that was just so helpful. I, I couldn't help but comment on it. You had three pictures lined up and we all know pictures worth a thousand words. Then there was the video and you, you described very clearly what the issue is. And just as a member of the public, it's, uh, it's incredibly helpful. So thank you. He's a professional consultant. So don't, you know, that's how, he, <laughs> but, but he, but we, we appreciate his work that he does for the committee too. And we value his expertise. You're making me blush. <laughs> Can't see it on this uh, resolution here. Um, okay. Uh, Donna D, the next member of the public that I see is Donna. There you are. Hi. Thank you. Um, thank you, Craig, for bringing this whole topic up. That's really the reason I'm on this call. <clears throat> I live on 87th Street between 2nd and 3rd, so I often pass by that. Well, actually, I often bypass that so sidewalk because I will just wait for the light to cross over 3rd Avenue at 86th rather than walk along 3rd Avenue from 86th to 87th because of the congestion and craziness that's going on there. Um, I mean, I, I appreciate Jared, what your, you know, your sympathy for the, uh, what's, uh, happening in front of your, um, your, your, your business. Um, I also own a car, which I park on 87th between, um, Lex and park in a garage. So I often have to make a right-hand turn from third Avenue onto 87th. I look at, you know, I, I don't know what's going on there. It's craziness. There's third, there's triple parked cars from 80, spanning from 86 to 87th. I actually one day wanted to just knock on their windows and saying, what are you waiting for? Like, who are you people? Because I, I, I'm i thinking it's, it's Chick-fil-A. Are they waiting for someone to come out of a movie? I don't know what the story is, but it's, it's really madness there. The sidewalk has gotten, you know, less congested, but, you know, that was one, another reason I was avoiding the space because you couldn't even walk. There was people waiting to get in the place. There's delivery guys, there's bicycles. Um, th there's a lot of trash on that whole span from 86 to 87. Um, you know, a lot of it is caused by other, I'm not saying it's his business, there's other businesses there, Papaya King and the candy store. And there was the Starbucks, but that, no, no, that Starbucks is open, sorry. Um, Anyway, I'm glad you brought it up. I hope that you guys can find some solution. I now know why that, I thought somebody created that little tent to keep them dry in the rain. I didn't understand. It was just sort of like the precursor of the um, outdoor dining. Um, but I do hope you find a solution because from what I understand, they're opening a Popeyes further up on, 80, on 3rd Avenue, which is a similar venue. And I hope the madness doesn't replicate itself up there. Thank you. Jared does too, I'm sure. Hope they're <laughs> not as good as his. Um, sorry for the editorial. But um, let's see, we have one other member of the public. It looks like Aura Masarski. Can we unmute uh, Aura Masarski? Good evening. Um, thank you for calling on me. Um, I want to say a few things. Uh, if you drive, well, you can't drive down 3rd Avenue, but if you walk down 3rd Avenue, one block south of Jared's uh, store, 
uh, on the southwest side of 86th and 3rd, you'll notice that the entire uh, curb lane, the, the parking lane, is always taken up first by the, the trucks and the SUVs of the vendors, some of whom uh, sell lovely things like counterfeit goods, which I understand is legal in New York, but nothing ever happens. They're always there. And then when they end their vending or so forth, it becomes fresh direct space. The sidewalk and usually two lanes of traffic are, usual, are always every day and every evening are fresh direct trucks so that a friend of mine came to visit from out of town and she tried to park at the, at the northeast, uh, no, sorry, the northwest corner of 85th and 3rd by the apartment building. And she was told by several of the Fresh Direct handlers, this is our space. You can't park here. Well, she's one small female. And she said, okay, I wasn't going to get into a thing with them. I know it's legal. And if you think this is an anomaly, walk one block east to Second Avenue and 85th Street, where you will see the same thing happening. Fresh Direct taking up two lanes of traffic because they have two trucks at any given time. And the guys are hanging out in the sidewalk, blocking out the sidewalk. But, you know, so it's, it's not an anomaly. Uh, if you have ever driven up Third Avenue and tried to make a left from Third Avenue going west on 86th Street, you will have to maneuver around three lanes of traffic. So I recognize that clearly double parking has always been a problem in New York, always, thousand years ago. It's become way worse since all these delivery situations happens and the vendors are out. My big concern is that I've spoken to the parking enforcement agents. They're very nice people. And I said, why, why are you not supposed to ticket these double parkers and people who are parking in what is clearly, you know, you can't park their old day zones. And the answers are number one, if they walk up to a guy who's double parked, what else do is either just drive around the corner and come back around or they'll threaten them. And as separate, and same thing about uh, Fresh Direct. Uh, so what I'm saying is, this is a huge situation that affects the entire city. It's not a one-off. So yeah, maybe someone complained about the Caldwell's store. So blame them for their success, but please do not expect them to enforce double parking laws and violations. It's just not their purview. No, thank you. Uh, one of the things just to be aware of is that this is something the committee has been aware of and has been dialogue with the Department of Transportation and, and they're actually gonna be sitting, we talked about that and discussing one of the earlier uh, items on the agenda. They're gonna be setting aside certain areas for these services to actually park and use that space because we have so many of these, whether it's Fresh Direct, whether it's Amazon, whether it's uh, Target, you, you name it, there's all kinds of trucks like that. And they have to, it's a way of life that we're gonna have to deal with. And I think there'll have to be adjustments made now the Department of Transportation does wanna make those adjustments. Um, let's, go, let's go to the board now. Uh, John Phillips, I believe is first. Can we unmute John? Okay. Go ahead, John. Yeah, there thank you, you. There you go. So, you know, with regard to 86th and 3rd, I've been walking down that block for over 20 years, 25 years. It's always been extremely congested. And I heard almost every single person who spoke tonight hint at some of the larger issues that I keep kind of pounding the drum about. As we go into the future, deliveries are going to grow exponentially. It's going to cause different traffic patterns. It's going to cause safety concerns on sidewalks in front of restaurants. And frankly, it's not a matter of supporting or not supporting small business. 
there is a, a, a kind of a new custom that we're all trying to figure out. So the delivery guys, when they come, they're not necessarily our employees. They don't necessarily have a, a company or a manager who is training them, training them on what to do and what not to do. Um, I experienced the same problem here. Um, we'll have eight, nine, 10 delivery guys show up in a 10 minute window and their bikes are everywhere. And we have to go out to the sidewalk and rearrange them. Um, another thing that I wanted to be very, very clear about is we can't conflate the outdoor dining program and some of the uses of that public space. Um, I understand why Chick-fil-A did what they did during the height of COVID. It absolutely makes sense to do that because the customers are being served on the sidewalk, perhaps maybe not at a table, but for takeout. Um, I think the real take home here is what are the streets going to look like if we don't do something about the double parking situation? How can we enforce some of the more obvious aspects of keeping the community safe and kept um, when we have a lot more delivery guys on the street? Um, these are all questions that we have to consider whenever we consider anything with regard to transportation. Um, one of the reasons why I'm so enthusiastic to be on the transportation committee is because I think it's the single biggest issue or topic we're going to have to grapple with going into the future. And done incorrectly, it'll affect everything. Um, you know, Chick-fil-A is very successful. Chick-fil-A is effectively what McDonald's was 20 or 30 years ago. The traffic patterns are probably similar. The difference is the technology and the ways in which the customers engage with that brand. Um, 86th, 87th um, on 3rd Avenue has always been a nightmare. Um, you know, the double and triple parking well predates COVID. Um, and then behavior on that corner as well. I mean, it is a relatively dirty corner. There's a lot of homelessness there. There's a lot of transients there. Um, and so th this is another one of those very complex issues. Um, and, you know, the way we start to frame these things is going to definitely put other things into perspective. Are we licensing bicycles? Um, who is enforcing bike laws? What do bike lanes look like? What are the rules concerning bikes when they're not actually in motion? Um, do we have... Um, enough space or capacity for these bikes to park, both for commercial and non-commercial bikers. Um, I think, um, you know, I think everybody's kind of on the right track. I mean, everything that everyone said really hints at those larger problems. Um, but, um, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, Chick-fil-A's hands are tied. I mean, unless they're going to staff someone to work the corner and make sure that their third-party delivery guys are paying attention to the rules. Um, Secondarily, I also am not convinced that there's a large percentage of delivery guys showing up in cars. Uh, my experience has been that the car delivery guys are the ones who are making far deliveries. And um, with a, a restaurant like Chick-fil-A, I would imagine that, you know, someone from downtown is not going to be hitting the Chick-fil-A on the Upper East Side for their order. Um, it's basically bad actors within the community and people who are waiting to do things other than Chick-fil-A on that corner. So that's about all I had to say about that. Thank you, John. And we welcome your participation on the committee. And as you said, uh, we have very important issues to look at as this city moves forward at this point. Um, Rita Popper. Can we unmute Rita? Hi, Jared. Thank you very much. Um, I love that you have so much business, but I have a question. Um, at All Wash's Bakery on 78th Street, you can order online and you get a number. And then you, when you show up, they go in and get you the number very quickly. There's somebody inside handing the bag to the person outside and it clears the cars that are up and it clears the sidewalk. Uh, do you think that sidewalk maintenance, it's almost like being a, a car hop, but uh, sidewalk maintenance will help you manage this traffic pattern better? Yeah, hey, Rita, that's a great question. Um, so we actually do this, we do a similar thing. We allow people to order online and they actually come into the restaurant and we have a little counter where they grab it and go. So. We, we usually always have the food ready for them ahead of time. So that, um, that, uh, the takeout, the takeout customer and the customer that's going to order through the line at the counter, the traditional way are both inside the restaurant. 
Um, they're not usually outside the restaurant, so it's not usually the issue. Um, and I would, I would agree with what John says. I, I think it started early on. I don't think there is, uh, there's definitely some people doing deliveries in cars, not a, not a large number. And I think it started with our customers, but over the last three to four months, I've really seen it's just people parking or just doing whatever they want to do. So um, I would probably say 25% of the cars parked there aren't even interested in Chick-fil-A at all um, is where it's gotten to. See, I was looking to save the time of mm -hmm. putting your car into gear, getting out of your car, getting into Chick-fil-A, going through and getting back into your car. You know, mm -hmm. So if somebody brought that that package, their, their order right to the car, it saves time. That's the only thing. I can't wait to, to be there myself, but um, thank you. I'm glad yeah. that your business is doing well. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Um, Michelle Birnbaum, can we unmute Michelle? Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Jared. I'm glad your business is doing well too. And I really appreciate that you're here and that you are responsive and engaged with us and the community. I'm very appreciative of that. I'm supportive, uh, Chuck, or uh, Colleen suggested the bike corral. And right. I'm very supportive of that in that location. And I welcome that letter. But I would like to have one thing included in that letter. And that is that the bike corral uh, be there for the duration of Chick-fil-A's lease or however you want to specify it so that it's designated for Chick-fil-A. And I say this because bike corrals can be in many different places on many different blocks. They don't necessarily correspond exactly to the business you know, that would be nearby and use them. And without a, um, a need for it, in other words, if that business was no longer there, I wouldn't want to see the corral there because we don't know whether or not it's a worthwhile thing based on what would be on that street at that time. So I'm just asking that in the letter that you write, which I'm supportive of, that you just include for the duration of Chick-fil-A's lease or however you want to put it, but for that location, as long as there's that kind of a restaurant there. So that's okay, well, my we'll, request. We'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, Rit is next, I believe. Rit, can we unmute Rit? Thanks. Thanks, Chuck. And, and I'd like to say also, you know, thanks, Jared, for, for being here. And it sounds like you have been trying to address this issue. And I'm sympathetic with the fact that some of the behavior um, really isn't directly under your control. I've got a couple of observations and, and then one question. One, I will point out, so, so this is my block. I live around the corner from your business. Um, and so I'm there every single day. Uh, and I do see we've got kind of the, the unintentional experiment because you are closed on Sundays because of your corporate policy. Um, there isn't really a problem on Sundays. Right. So it may be that some of the cars are, are not related to your, your business, but I got to say the vast majority of the really bad behavior, the cars, cars like waiting in the middle of third Avenue, like that is due to, that is due to your customers. Um, anecdotally, you probably have better um, information on this than I do, but what I observe is that yes, they are customers. They are probably not delivery people. Frankly, I've seen people sitting in their car in a travel lane eating uh, your sandwiches out of the bag. Um, so clearly they're not, they're not just doing deliveries. Although I agree with, um, the person who spoke early on about the idea that perhaps as a community board and certainly as a city, we need to start thinking about the delivery apps, um, and differentiating between those that are using cars and those that are using bikes and e-bikes, um, just because of the space that they take up. I guess I, have, I really have two questions. One is, and, and forgive my ignorance for, for not knowing the full details of how, how this all works. Do you have a sense of, of where your orders are coming from? Um, that's one question. You know, so if somebody places an order on Uber Eats or, or whatever, do you have any sense of, are they local? Are they coming from far away? Is there data on who's doing the pickup yeah. um, and by what mode? And the second question uh, is around, um, how, whether you have like what percentage of your business is from 
delivery companies versus walk-ins or direct customers? Yeah. So one thing with the third party uh, delivery companies is the, their, their the customer data is like their greatest asset. And so they don't give that up um, at all. So I can just say based on, um, I mean, anecdotally, I, I would say it's, it's a pretty dense uh, residential area around us. So I think most of them are staying pretty close. They usually, I know they usually, uh, they have algorithms on, on, on ride times is how they factor in what the boundary is of who could order a Chick-fil-A sandwich from us and get it delivered to their house. So they control that boundary. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second question again? Uh, I think you kind of answered it. I, I was okay. what for what, but I was just thinking about what percentage of your business, roughly speaking, and and I realize you may feel this is too sensitive to share. Like comes from the delivery uh, companies versus those who are who are walking in or driving in. Yeah, I I, I don't know off the top of my head. I would say the walk up, uh, walk up guests and delivery are like pretty pretty similar. So a, a, a lot a, a large portion compared to two years ago, put it that way, much more. Thanks. Yeah, I, I just want to build on what Rit asked. I, I guess I want to comment on the fact that Uber is notorious for not sharing any information with anyone in terms of their core business in, of um, ride sharing. And it's not surprising to hear that they are as protective of their secret sauce when it comes to Uber Eats as well. Um, so I suppose that means you also don't have any sense of what their typical delivery boundaries are, do you? No. That must be really frustrating. Do you have any sense, and then I don't want to take time from others, but do you have any sense as to what your um, partners at other um, branches are doing to um, control similar types of situations? I know, the, and, and clearly I look to see where they were um, scattered across Manhattan. And in many of those locations, it, it would be pretty much impossible to be able to double park there just because of the high volume of traffic that there is all throughout the day, like in the core of Midtown and such. So I know it's a little different here in a much more residential area, but I'm just curious if you yeah. know what they're doing. Uh, I don't, I don't know too many particulars. I will say a lot of the Chick-fil-A are in Midtown where there's um, just less people right now because of uh, office buildings and whatnot. So, um, I mean, I, I don't, I couldn't speak specifically to it, but I would just assume a little bit less congestion, less people. So um, I don't think it's been an issue, but you know, in the future probably will be a similar situation what we have right here. All right. Thanks. Peter Borak wanted to, Say something here. Yeah, thanks so much for, uh, for coming today. Um, Chuck, question for you is, do we need to make a motion for the bike corral? Um, I know no. that we were gonna send it administrative, but okay, uh, great. No. So th thanks so much. Just wanted to thank, uh, I think it was Jeff for coming today and for being a good neighbor. Um, this is really a question for Chuck. You know, I, I just think it's, it's a somewhat outlandish to expect the proprietor of a business to enforce double and triple parking. Um, that's just, you know, I think we can expect them and hope that they would take out um, trash that's maybe not theirs down the block. I know Shake Shack does that as well. Um, but to expect them to enforce parking just seems a little um, a little unrealistic. And, you know, Chuck and Craig, it seems like, you know, in the past year or so, a lot of these problems do come back to the lack of enforcement. And I know that the traffic folks from the NYPD have come in before. It might be time to consider bringing them back in and just having a chat with them about some of the key issues that we're having on the Upper East Side, because I just don't think that they're really living up to um, what our expectations are for them. Um, so that, that's really what I want to say. And the last point is, um, I, I actually moved to the Upper East Side in 1992. And for decades, I was forced to go, uh, when I wanted a chicken sandwich, to the McDonald's on 86th Street for the McChicken sandwich. And um, many probably realized that it just doesn't live up to what Chick-fil-A standards are. And so when Chick-fil-A moved to the city, it was just it was a great day for New York. And so thanks, uh, thanks for um, um, conducting your business. It's really appreciated. You make great sandwiches. Thank you, Peter. Um, we did have traffic enforcement. And one of the things they said was they have about four or five people in 
our whole district for all kinds of traffic enforcement and that we we raise it in the bike context but this is the car context and so that's that's one of the problems with trying to get enforcement what they really need are a lot more people and that's an issue we have to deal with and we may want to see what we can do in that regard perfect um let's see i think a few more hands and then we'll call it quits here uh Thales wanted to comment can we unmute Thales? as you can unmute whenever you're ready Um, it's a problem. I don't hear you. Hey guys, so, sorry, I'm just on two calls. Um, great conversation around Chick fil A. You touched most of the big points. Um, I did want to raise the question uh, if you look at Shake Shack, very similar model, um, your facility may be undersized for your, for your volume of traffic um, because they have, a, they have two ways to get in and to get out. Uh, so that's one thing I wanted to raise to your attention. Um, and then the other one was um, the McDonald's comment. Uh, they're the differentiator that they have a drive-through uh, mechanism. But it raises the question is you may want to consider a ghost facility to support your delivery traffic versus your um, on-prem traffic. And uh, that might be something that might make some sense for you guys. Um, apart from that, I think we talked about it. Uh, you may want to add some, some additional garbage cans with, with your, your branding on it because a lot of that garbage is, uh, I think, coming out of your, your clientele as well. They park and eat. That's the, a big challenge too. So those are my comments, um, but I'm glad we're, we're taking care, uh, taking attention. Okay. <clears throat> now next, thank you, Thomas. Um, Elaine Walsh, who's been done, been doing great work for the East 86th Street uh, Association, um, knows that area a little bit. She's been around a little bit in the up in, in that area for not too many years. <clears throat> Born and raised on 86 between second and third. <laughs> exactly. And, um, I've seen changes. A couple of things, and I will talk to Craig and, and uh, Chuck on something offline. But my concern, and, the, and I will talk as East 86th Street president, the concern has been the congestion, the garbage, the lack of any responsibility for most of the store owners, including, uh, I won't name any. And the frustration is that there's also a sense of lack of safety. And so we worked with one of the apartment buildings to look at for their tenants, because they're it, it's a rental, how to walk safely in the area. And that has become very successful. Third Avenue and 86th and 87th has always been a problem, whether it was the movie stand or Papaya King, etc. And we had two other food stores uh, next to where Chick-fil-A is uh, and Chick-fil-A took one of them. It's a narrow sidewalk. And so there's not enough space to walk. So the option of putting the bikes in a corral or under the tent was to help with safety. And we as an association were involved in that because it was so dangerous. And Jared and his people cleaned that whole area. So we've been fortunate to start to have it look better. The garbage cans, I wish Papaya King would do something. And John, I know your family used to be involved with that group. The bigger question around there, and Aura spoke to it, are the FedEx, Fresh Direct, UPS, who were parking double and triple between 86th and 87th. And Andrew worked with Ben Kalos to move them off there that site. And let me just say as an aside, we do have a half hour load on load where trucks can do that in this area. They don't respect it. And we have no enforcement. When we go down south on third, we've got the same problems. And there is the double parking outside McDonald's. 
So it's not just Chick-fil-A. And they do not and cannot control those bicycle people. If I walk where I live now, I've got those bike people hanging out and I can't even walk down the street. They're two doors from where there's a food place. So we have a problem. Let me tell you, and we've tried to fight this. We've got a vendor issue that takes all of the parking, no tickets, no nothing. And we have a RV on 86th Street between 3rd and Lex. Food is sold from there. It's, if I can get, remember the name, just a second, I have to get my notes. Casa Biera. And they use on their website an address, 184 East 86th Street. That's ultra. That is not them. If they don't get the parking space, which is illegal, by the way, because you cannot bend in a metered space, they double park all day. No one gives them a ticket. No one says anything to them. And we know they're not paying the same taxes that Chick-fil-A pays. So I would like the Transportation Department to, um, Committee, again, to get DOT, and Colleen, I'm glad you're on this, to start to look at some of these regulations and work with their city agencies on enforcement. It's not a local community group or a restaurant to do the work. We need to see DOT work with traffic and with police. 86 Street, we did get some signs changed. No park and uh, no standing. Wonderful. The food vendors are still on the north side between third and second. Didn't matter and they get no tickets. And yes, Chuck, I can understand you have four or five people you say that uh, traffic enforcement says they have for the area. Well, I'd be glad to give them the one that's always on our block that tickets or the residential cars. Put well, them up in the area that, we need. That, that's a different, that's the problem. One of the problems, Elaine, is those really aren't traffic enforcement. Those are just people to give right, parking. Tickets. Parking tickets. The, the issue is the issue is you need people who can handle things you're talking about, double parking and all that right. stuff. But they give the tickets for so start the tickets after three tickets. The sheriff's department is supposed to get involved in tow. So let's see some enforcement. I was very upset to see how Chick Fil A was reached out to um, for this meeting, and that's why I, I did come on because I was concerned for the small businesses and they're not aware of community boards. Let's be very honest, who is? Even non-small business owners aren't, okay? But I would hope that things could be worked out, that Jared gets the assistance he needs, but also the support from the city agencies. And by the way, those double park cars, et cetera, triples, yeah, they are food delivery. We've seen them, we've watched them. Some indeed eat and either have a papaya hot dog or they have a Chick-fil-A. Now, John may have alluded to some things. Yes, are some of them into drugs? Of course we know that, but nobody's enforcing it. But I'm asking that the committee and, and DOT work together, but DOT needs to work with its sister agencies to help clean up that area. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. I think one of the things that we have been thinking about is how we can have the people that write the parking tickets have a broader jurisdiction because there are many, many Double more thing. of them and they're yes. walking around and they're there all the time and broaden out their jurisdiction to give tickets for all kinds of stuff. Now it's a bifurcated jurisdiction. The police traffic enforcement people, the ones they ride around in cars, and they're the ones that are like four or five of them for the whole area. And they, and they're the only ones that can handle those kinds of things. So we're, I think, I, I think the key is to get the jurisdiction broadened for the people who can, who are now just giving parking tickets. I agree with you totally, but the police are also not enforcing. I mean, we've seen them, they sit in the car on 86th Street and they don't get out and they don't do anything. So 
I'm asking that the city agencies work together to come up with some solutions. And if they need some leadership, reach out to the community. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Elaine, appreciate it. Valerie Mason. Thank you. Um, first of all, Jared, thank you so much for coming to the community board uh, in, in response to your first invitation. Usually it takes a couple of invitations to get somebody to come. So um, we're excited to have you in the neighborhood and congratulations on having an overflowing business. Um, it's always nice to hear. Um, I just wanted to talk about this in a little bit broader context because I think Rit also touched on it when he made the comment that, you know, it's on a Sunday, um, you notice that there's not as much congestion when, this, when the store is closed. We, we have the same incident here on 72nd Street with a different kind of business and a different kind of customer. And that happens to be at the end of 72nd Street where we have the medical uh, establishments. And we have a, a double parking and a triple parking and people can't get into their own residences because cars are double and triple parked. And it's the same issue of enforcement. So it's happening everywhere, whether it's on a congested commercial street or it's on a congested keyhole street where there are you know, numerous doctors and, and uh, x-ray whatever in one or two buildings. And, you know, you can't even get one car up and down and, and that's Monday through Friday because they're not open on Saturday and Sunday. So we know who's causing the congestion there. And it's the same issue. We can't get anybody to write tickets and we can't get anybody over there to move the cars that are waiting for customers to come out of these buildings. So it's the same issue. But in terms of, of this problem, um, I'm just wondering, you know, everybody's talking about interagency cooperation. Um, I noticed that on the, on the email that Will sent to uh, Jared, there was a sort of relationship person for Chick-fil-A that was also copied. And I only mentioned that in the context, I think we've got to get the delivery services to come to one of our meetings and talk about how they're conducting their businesses. And I don't know if that's an, something that, you know, needs to be done you know, by the Department of Transportation with all community boards participating. But I think there has to be some corporate responsibility for what is happening here. And, you know, as you know, a lot of the people who are forced to use these services, and I'm talking about the small businesses as well as consumers, there doesn't, there seems to be like a black hole here or somebody behind, a wizard behind a curtain who doesn't have to answer to anybody. And that shouldn't be. Because while we're talking about putting bike corrals on the street, my opinion is that these corporations should be caring about the people who are delivering these food. We have plenty of open storefronts that can be le leased by these services to provide a place <laughs> to quote, corral these, these bikes, as well as giving these guys who, and women too, who are have these almost incredible hours, no place to go to the bathroom, no place to hide from the cold and no place to get any kind of, you know, coolness in the summer. And those are the kinds of corrals that we, sh we should be seeing. And it shouldn't be the responsibility of Chick-fil-A or any other business to do this. I mean, the, these corporations are making money both ways from the customer and the small businesses, and they should have to provide something. And I think we should just like we contacted the relationship person for Chick-fil-A, we should try to get these delivery services to come to one of our meetings and have some responsibility for what's going on in, the, in our neighborhood as well as others. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. We, we'll see if we can do that. Uh, and I think it'd be a good idea to get them in here and just talk to them about some of those things. Um, I think we should call a halt to this discussion now. I see Michelle and Ritz and it, we've already had discussion on this, and and um, but I think we have we want to we have a few other things that we have to get through tonight. And we've been at it for a while, um, so I think what we'll do is we'll write a letter to the Department of Transportation on the bike corral. We'll see what we can do with enforcement targeting that area, and I think if we ask them to target that area, they will, and um, and we'll see if there are other solutions that we can come up with. Then we. Jared, uh, we appreciate your coming in here today and tonight, and uh, you know, and 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 
I know that everyone said you've been a, a very good neighbor cleaning up the whole area, not only around your restaurant, but down the street from that. And we appreciate that. And uh, we hope your experience here tonight hasn't scared you away from the community board. I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you all giving me the chance to share, and I look forward to continue to work with with you guys and being in touch. So, and I want to express the same sentiments as well. I think you've been very brave coming out here. I want to reiterate: we're trying our best. Not, we're not trying to single you out. I think this is something that we would do if we saw it with any any business or entity where we see that there is a safety issue, especially and. Our goal is always to work with people, and we are very excited to see that you have been so successful, and we wish you continued success and look forward to working with you in the future. And are glad that we could get you, hopefully, by Corrals very shortly. Thanks again. Okay, next item is the Ash Mapper data overview, and I know that Rit had asked for if we could have some kind of reporting on and statistics, and I think it was, and and I know uh, Craig had looked into this very carefully. And uh, Craig, why don't you uh, go ahead and uh, talk about the crash map or uh, data stuff? And, and and I will try to be very brief because I know that we are getting late. I am going to, will if possible, try to share my screen. If go ahead. my computer crashes, I'm going to immediately log on on a different computer. <laughs> so let's see how this goes. Well. Um, okay, I think this hopefully will work. All right, are we there? Yeah. Yes, we can see it. Okay, excellent. At least the first page. Right. Um, let me just go to the website. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see what the website looks like. So this is crashmapper.org. And this is a website that essentially aggregates all the open source data collected by New York City and maps out information pertaining to vehicular traffic incidents, crashes. And the luxury of this is that you're able to actually dig down by community board level to be able to choose timeframes and filters to be able to hone in on specific um, timeframes and the types of incidents and number of incidents that take place. So right now what you're looking at is a, a map showing where crashes have taken place in the month of November of 2021. And you can see down here, we have 40 total crashes and it breaks down the number of injuries that resulted from them. Um, some of the factors that were identified, I guess, through the police reports related to them. And again, data is only as good as the data that is collected. So it's only reported data. So anything that gets officially entered into a database. So while there may be more incidents that weren't reported, these are the ones that, are, that make up the official reports. And the nice thing is that you can very quickly just change your time frame and and essentially just create a, a new map and be able to try to determine potential trends that you see and, and hotspots. And I think even here, this I've now zoomed out to um, look at the entirety of 2021 and 2021 has been a very low year, a year with a relatively low amount of crashes, largely due to different traffic patterns as a result of the pandemic. But you could see, um, some of the locations where you've had multiple incidents and the ones in darker red are the ones that have resulted in actual fatalities. So you can see them based off of corridors and on and each street. And again, you can see the statistics here. And it's just a really great tool for anyone who wants to learn about um, crash data. So Speaking of which, I'm just going to quickly just show you, because one of the other luxuries of this is that you are able to um, actually download data and, and work with it in Excel. And me being a planner and Excel geek, I had a great time <laughs> actually just compiling information that I can just quickly show. So 
I'm just going to do some summary information regarding crash data. I'll show you a few different slides that I put together. Um, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to work with you and give you any information that you may want. They started collecting data in 2012, but the data seemed incomplete. So I'm only using data from 2013 on. And you can see here total crashes and then broken down by the type of injuries that resulted from them as well. So in the since 2013, there have been about 20, over 28,000 crashes in our community district. And this does include Roosevelt Island. And I apologize that in the upcoming slides, I didn't really include Roosevelt Island, but it, the numbers are so small comparative to Manhattan that it didn't make sense from a presentation perspective to be able to include it. But if anyone is interested, I can certainly provide those figures that I came across. Um, so just in terms of total crashes, unfortunately, uh, I don't know if this is blocking it. The blue represents the cross streets and the red represents avenues. So you can see the distribution among those that occurred on cross streets versus avenues. But what is interesting is avenues here on the red are in um, the red line. And you can see that starting around 2014. Craig, I don't think we can see what you're, you're pointing to. Okay. Yeah, I don't think you don't have the right slide up, but I think, Greg, it's still no, January to November of 2021. Oh, oh, sorry. I need to, I need to, thank you. I need to um, change what I'm sharing. That's why. All right, just give me one second here. Okay, so this was the, the chart I was just alluding to before where I've broken out the, um, the crashes total crashes and crashes by category for each year. Um, and I was trying to then visually depict it. So as I said, over the years, we've had slightly more crashes on the avenues versus the streets, but the trend lines are really interesting because you could see starting in 2014, we saw a precipitous decline in terms of crashes that took place on the avenues. And while such declines did not occur on the cross streets. And this may very well have to do with Vision Zero being implemented and, and the success of Vision Zero on, um, on the major corridors, the avenues um, resulting in safer conditions, but they didn't really translate to cross streets. And then of course, once the pandemic hit, the numbers just came, came down very dramatically as a result of much less vehicular traffic in 2020 and the recovery in 2021 and the change in travel habits. This here is just a chart showing for each avenue, um, the trend lines from 2013 on. And I also included the FDR drive because the FDR drive- Craig, is I still I, Craig, I still don't think we're seeing the slides no. you want us to see. Right. No, I, sorry, let, oh. let me see what happened. Um, Sorry, I, I clicked on the wrong one. Here's the chart. There you go. There we go. Now I got it right. There's the chart. Here are the trend lines. And you can see, as I was saying, avenues in red, the drop starting in 2014, and, and then the further drop um, during um, the pandemic period. The cross streets did not have a similar drop starting in 2014. Um, and I think that warrants more exploration. This is the chart I was just alluding to regarding the avenues. And I was just pointing out the FDR drive um, is in a category of its own and is a, is really a hot spot all along in terms of, of crashes. And you can see here how each of the avenues have responded over the year and years and how Second Avenue, perhaps it was because of Vision Zero, perhaps it was because of subway construction subsiding, but Second Avenue saw a very precipitous drop, um, but all the avenues did. I don't know why that went back um, a few slides. So um, you could see here just each of the avenues by comparison and where the incidents have occurred. In terms of the cross streets, the 60s, which is the bar on the left, has a significantly higher number of crashes that have occurred versus the 70s and then the 80s and then 
uh, the 90s, although of course the 90s only covers from 90th to 96th Street. But it seems as if the further south you get, and perhaps it's just because there's more congestion and more vehicular activity, that there are more crashes taking place. And when you look at it based off of uh, on a street by street basis with 96th Street on the top, 60th Street on the bottom, you could really see the streets that have the most amounts of crashes, 60th through 63rd Street, and then you have spikes at the major cross streets, 72nd, 79th, and 86th Street. So that's just an overview of the data. And as I said, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I didn't know if this was going to perhaps in, inform potentially our next topic, but I thought it would be just helpful to be able to share this and help people understand the data that is available that we can look at on a whim if we wanted to. So I'm happy to take any questions. Um, so I think we have from the public, Andy Rosenthal. Can Andy be muted, unmuted, please? Yeah, Craig, thank you very, very much for this. I've been using Crash Mapper for years, and I think it's really an important tool for the whole committee to see. So I applaud you for doing this tonight. I do have a question, and I don't really have an answer for it, a uh, true question, which is, my understanding was that uh, a lot of these are mapped to intersections nearby. So it might happen on a cross street, but it would just, if the police report it to the nearest intersection, it might show up in your data as the avenue. So um, you may correct me, but it may be that this data isn't even as clean as you would want it to be. I have a feeling you're probably correct about that. However, that being said, you would expect to see similar drops both on the avenues and the streets and in, in, as opposed to there being a bias that would affect only the avenues versus the streets in terms of the trend lines. So that's where it's, I, I, I wonder whether there's something else going on over there. All right, thank you, Andy. Um, if there are no more public members of the public who wish to speak, um, Alita. Thank you. I was just wondering if there's data about drunk drivers, hit and run drivers, and if there are specific areas. I noticed that Fifth Avenue has the least amount of crashes. It is the least um, commercial street, I guess, maybe with Park Avenue. Madison Avenue is low, too. If looking at Lexington, for instance, um, if I guess all of it is, is pretty commercial, um, just whether the data is broken down more because we see a lot of congestion on Lexington is basically one lane, lots of double parking of trucks mostly. Um, and also if there's data, did I already ask you this about trucks, whether trucks are responsible for any of the accidents? Yeah, I don't know that they're, that I'm trying to see if they break it out by vehicle type. I thought I saw that somewhere here. Yes, you can filter it out by vehicle type involved um, and by crash type. And under the list of contributing factors, they do indicate when you have um, alcohol involved, I suppose they may, I don't know if alcohol is a catch-all for alcohol and drugs, but they have everything from aggressive driving and road rage to passenger distraction to speeding, driver inexperience, um, traffic control, disregard, failure to yield the right of way, and so on and so forth. So it, again, the data is only as good as whoever is, is, I guess, submitting the reports and writing up the reports, but it gives a good overview of what the issues are. Thank you. All right, we have Rita. Rita, Rita, yes, yeah. Do we know um, if the if the if a car is involved, uh, whether it is a privately owned car or it is a car for hire? Because people who drive their own cars have a vested interest in keeping it working versus. Uh, taxi drivers who um, don't own their cars. Is there a breakout of who owns a car and who doesn't own a car? 
from what I can see, I don't believe that is broken out, at least in the data that it, you can download and work with. And the other question, first of all, I want to tell you, I think you did a phenomenal job. Absolutely. Is there a difference between day, the accidents during the day and the accidents at night? And I will preface it by telling you that I wear a black coat. I wear a lot of black in the winter. And bicyclists wearing black with a black bicycle without a headline is very hard to see. And I wish, I wish if nothing else, that we had mandatory headlights and taillights on back bikes. But is it, do they break it out day or night? I'm actually just opening the raw data right now, and I will have an answer in a second. I'm just looking to see if they, they do have time, dates and times for, for each. So assuming that the time that the timestamp of the incident is accurate or of the report, you can probably do a breakdown based off of the hour by day. That's something I could definitely easily um, try to do. Um, and I could do it pretty quickly. So I'm happy to get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for what you did. It's really appreciated. You're very welcome. All right, I guess if there are no further- um, Thank you, Craig. Questions, we can move um, on. I guess we talked about, I guess we talked about item number five. I don't know if there's anything we have to talk about right now on that, unless you wanted to. I, I thought we would give um, anyone who's in attendance the opportunity to provide their own um, opinions if they had any in terms of potential future um, protected bike lane corridors. Maybe people don't have any, but um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if anyone showed up specifically to talk about that. So. Um, I just want to provide people the chance. Yeah. Okay. If anyone wants to comment on that, um, I see Michelle's hand up. I don't see anyone. Is there anyone else? Yeah, we have a person you? from the public named Matt. Uh, oh, okay. Why don't we ask the public, member of the public first to do that? Oh, here it is. Uh, Matt Moreno. Hello. Matt, can, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, yes, everyone. We well, thanks very much for, for giving me the chance to talk, and thanks for uh, for putting this on the agenda. Um, you know, I really appreciated the uh, the support of the uh, the community board for the bike lane build out uh, over the last uh, decade or so in the Upper East Side. Um, you know, clearly there's a there's a need for cross town corridors uh, being safe, but um, I wanted to also raise the issue, uh, which is related, uh, of the design quality and the build quality uh, of the infrastructure that's been built so far, and. You know, what we have uh, on the Upper East Side really ranges from, you know, very hardened infrastructure, relatively hardened infrastructure on First Avenue, where there's, uh, you know, they poured concrete, they put wide lanes in, uh, there's a lot of, uh, lot of support there. Uh, and then that ranges from really the newer stuff, which has been installed um, maybe in the lower sections of Second Avenue, uh, and in particular, the Crosstown 61st and 62nd Street lanes, which are called protected by the DOT, but essentially have zero protection whatsoever. Uh, and so, you know, these lanes have been around for a year or two ago. They were sold to the community board as being protected lanes. Uh, but every day you try to use them and there's cars basically driving through them. Um, you know, I was coming home uh, today uh, at 60th and York. So this is, um, this is where DOT has built a two-way bike lane on the south side of the street. There's no protection. And I'm looking across the street and I see a lane of maybe seven or eight cars basically going around the queue for the FDR driving through the bike lane. So if somebody were in that bike lane, they could be heading against traffic and all of a sudden they're just facing a, uh, you know, this onslaught of drivers. And that's, you know, I think this is a real issue. I mean, clearly enforcement has been uh, a problem and, um, you know, I don't think you can put it on NYPD. I mean, the, the precinct has gone out there and they've announced uh, making, you know, setting tickets to people in the bike lane. But, um, you know, if there's, if there's no, if there's, if the infrastructure doesn't prevent it, it's going to happen. And this is, uh, this is a big deal, right? The, um, you know, the greenway is going to be closed. It is closed. It's going to be closed in the future, uh, which is one of the few kids safe routes uh, on the east side. Um, you know, looking north and south, first and second half are really not right now uh, where you would take your kids cycling, uh, especially since traffic has returned, um, you know, maybe a year and a half ago uh, during the pandemic, they were much, they felt much safer.
or with lighter traffic. And I would really ask the board to, uh, to put some pressure on DOT uh, to, to install infrastructure that really is safe for, for all the members of the community. And, you know, there's clearly a huge gap in the Upper East Side and crosstown lanes. There's also a, a gap in up and downtown lanes. I mean, you can, um, you know, Ben uh, and actually the, um, you know, the prior stats, uh, Park Avenue would be a great candidate. I mean, if you're, if you're in the center median lanes, there's no buses, there's no trucks, uh, and there's a lot fewer turns, and there's essentially no double parking. Uh, these are all the biggest conflicts that are that are generally present on the uh, the bike lane infrastructure that there is today. So I would really ask the the board both not only to um, to consider uh, expansion opportunities across town lanes, but also to increase the standards so that um, there's serious protection uh, and that the lanes are wide enough uh, that people can actually get through them. Some of the um, some of the protected lanes, uh, the cross town lanes that have been built out in CB6 uh, to the south. Uh, they're extremely narrow. They have maybe a three or four foot bike lane. Whereas if you look on first and second avenues, the standard bike lane, the green paint there is about six feet wide. So that is reasonable space for, for bikes to be able to pass each other, bikes with kids, bikes with things on them. Uh, whereas some of uh, what DOT has been doing uh, is really inadequate for the traffic levels that we're seeing today. So thanks again for, for taking uh, comments from the community. Uh, and I, I really do hope that uh, for your continued attention to this issue. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, the, the, the issue of hardening those uh, uh, bike lanes, I think, is, a, is an important one. Um, do we have anything? I don't see any other members of the public. Uh, Will, do you see anyone? Andy Rosenthal, just recently. Yes, Andy oh, okay. Rosenthal. Go ahead, Andy. Okay, go ahead, Andy. Yeah. At, at the risk of overstaying my welcome tonight, um, I would love <laughs> to initiate a real proposal tonight to put in a protected, speaking of the infrastructure that gentleman just mentioned, a protected crosstown bike lane on 72nd Street or adjacent streets if necessary, uh, according to DOT's expertise. But uh, CB7 has passed the resolution asking for a protected bike lane on West 72nd Street. And it would be great for that to become a river to river corridor uh, as Ben mentioned at the opening of tonight, that uh, you know it's been years since many people have made proposals, but uh, we haven't seen much progress on getting cross town lanes, and there really is no safe way across at this point between the 60s um, and uh, you know all the way uptown. Really, there, you know we need protected cross town lanes. Uh, I bike across 72nd Street all the time. Uh, there's plenty of room there for a bike lane. Um, it hopefully wouldn't even need to take out uh, any parking. Um, right now, it's essentially six lanes of asphalt. Two are taken up with parking. Two are taken up with double parking. We really only have a one-lane road on 72nd for the vast majority of it. Um, I think there's plenty of room there, and uh, I would encourage CB8 to start the discussion as to where we can place safe transportation network. We're going to get more traffic once we get an additional lane for pedestrians and bikes on the 59th Street Bridge. Uh, we know that's in the works and is supposed to open next year. That's going to bring more bikers. Biking uh, is still zooming across the entire city. So this is, this is something we need more of these, not less of these. And the bike infrastructure that you've put in to date has worked. Uh, if you look at national trends on fatalities, they've been going up. But as the data you saw tonight uh, from Crash Mapper, uh, even if we're holding even, we're doing a good job. And uh, it looks like you know, crashes have been coming down. So Vision Zero uh, has been working to some extent. And uh, I think this committee needs to think forward a bit and ta start talking about where we can place protected crosstown bike lanes. Andy, just historically to we, we DOT came forward with a proposal for a lane across 72nd Street. And there was such intense opposition that they withdrew that. And you know, so that doesn't mean they couldn't come up with another one, but 72nd Street, I think would be a very difficult uh, thing for, to, implement, you know, to get implemented on, on this side because some of the things, you know, because they've created, uh, you know, they have the bus uh, situation there. And as you say, it's one lane now uh, that, for a lot of it. But that's you know, that's something to be to be discussed uh, further. And obviously, we couldn't we wouldn't discuss anything unless we put out a notice so that people could uh, to could come and you know and and 
be heard on the subject. Chuck, um, when was that DOT presentation on 72nd May? Because that was before my time, I guess, attending these meetings. Yes, that was, I'm trying to think, it was a few years back. It, what would you say? It was before uh, my time. No, it wasn't that much. No, wasn't it wasn't in 2016. Valerie, Valerie says she remembers this issue because she's the 72nd Street uh, Association there. Uh, no, in 2016 was, was 7071. It wasn't 70, it wasn't 70 seconds. Yeah. No, I, we, I we, wanna, yeah, go I ahead, just, Valerie. I just want to add there's a major difference between West 72nd Street and East 72nd Street. Andy, I appreciate what you're saying. But I think you you hit on the fact that it's a one lane, even though there are six, it's really one lane. And it is the de the designated ambulance street to go to all the hospitals that are on York Avenue. And therefore, I mean, I was told by DOT that that could not be a protected bike lane for that very reason. Um, because there is only one as you correctly point out, one operative lane on each side of the of the median there. And m m nine times out of 10, there's an ambulance, one or two ambulances coming down the street. And so I think that's, you know, regardless of my personal feeling about whether it should be on 72nd Street or not, I think that is a major impediment to using 72nd Street. Okay, okay. so Valerie, um, humor me this. If we took out a, a parking lane on one side or the other, north or south, not both of them, one of them and made it a two-way bike lane, that would give you the exact amount of car traffic space that you have today. So that would not impede. Well, okay, let me, let me well, come well, back well, to wait, you. Wait, wait a second, this. Valerie. Wouldn't you rather be not, on uh, a more narrow street than on a major artery with a bike? I'd like to be you connected, I don't really care. But 72nd makes a lot of sense because it is the way to get to the west side from the east side and vice versa. Valerie, let's not get into a cross discussion about this. I just want to, Colleen, do you remember, because I presided, uh, Craig and I presided over these Oh, gosh, you know what, hearings. Chuck? I, maybe it was before you, Craig, but I, it was I remember before me. 72nd. I, I don't recall um, us coming to present on 72nd Street, to be honest with you, because i um, I think Josh Orzak was the liaison at the time for your um, community board. But as the gentleman mentioned, CB7 did issue a resolution asking DOT to look at um, a cross tongue bike lane river to river on 72nd Street. Um, and they have been, um, you know, position. asking us about the status of, of that. And, and, you know, again, if we were to do something like that, we have to do a lot of research and outreach and, look at right. the, um, the street segments and, and, and the land use. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's not as easy uh, as, you know, implementing something overnight. Yeah. I, I, and I can just, I, I look back in 2016 was when we had the original proposals, the ones that Ben, the ones that Ben was talking about earlier. Um, yeah. With, um, 70th, 70 for, well, originally it was 67, 68th, 77, 78th, 84th, 85th. And then ultimately right, right. we shifted it to 70th, 71st based off of community feedback. What you have to do is Google Woody Allen Community Board Aid and you can see when that discussion <laughs> took place, which, is in, right. which was in um, 2016. Yeah, 2016, I okay. Came up. I don't think 72nd came up at that time. Right. It wasn't seriously no, okay. considered then. Mm -hmm. So if... If anything, it was is prior to that. That's correct. I'll let you. I'll let you preside over the ne the next seventy second Street hearing. <laughs> Anyhow, so let's see. We have some public. Uh, to wants to Paul Quickler wants to come in on this. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Paul. Thank you very much, Chuck. I think we should look at the the bigger vision of what New York City should be like. The three best places to ride a bike in this in this borough, the Central Park Loop, the East River Greenway, and the Hudson River Greenway. They're fabulous places to bike. Kids are there in numbers, adults, because it's safe and it's away from cars. But we have no easy ways to get from any of these things to each other, which is ridiculous because you've got to get your bike there. We need to have something visionary like crosstown protected bikeways river to river from 59th all the way up to the top of the park every 10 blocks or every half a mile 
And there are issues clearly about how you do it. I mean, they're probably phenomenal. We went and did some investigation recently. We did a ride for about two and a half hours of myself and a few other people. It's very hard to navigate your way across from the river to river anywhere in the city directly. There's lots of uh, big, hairy issues. How do you get across the park itself? Guess what? On the bridal path in the park, it's a parking lot for the private vehicles of parks employees and of the police department. So the idea should be that if you have um, cars parked there, hmm, why can't you have bicycles riding there make it a proper bike path just north of 80 Smiths or the transverses? There are ideas that you could close down the transverses to car traffic and make it busway only with bike paths. These are all hugely complicated issues, but we need to be visionary and do something dramatically different. As recently as a couple of years ago, um, Dr. Daniel Kahneman was killed because he was on the transverse 96th Street because he had nowhere to go across the park safely on a bicycle to his job at, I think, Mount Sinai. We're failing people miserably in the city. So I'm asking this Community Board Transportation Committee, I guess I asked the chairs, to, to take up, to help us get resolutions before this board to get crosstown protected bikeways every 10 or blocks or every half a mile up and down the park, river to river, to match what we think will happen and hope will happen on the west side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, okay, let's go to the board. Michelle Birnbaum. Thank you, Chuck. You know, it's very late. There's only 24 people that are still on this call. This is a major subject. It was fifth on what turned out to be a very long agenda. I think it needs serious posting, it needs lengthy discussion, and it needs a much broader atten attendance. So I would like to say that we table this discussion for now and um, bring it up another time when, when, if you're thinking of any spots that they be properly posted, that it be one either first on the agenda or just with a few things on the agenda, but it's certainly not a conversation that we should be having tonight at this hour with this level of attendance and no posting anyway. So I would like to say that we should table this discussion now. Well, Michelle, we're not, before we do any specific locations, we'd obviously post it. We're not talking about specific locations here, but let, why don't I just, why don't we just take a few, Rit wanted to speak on this and he and, and Peter, so Valerie's already gotten into the conversation a little bit, but why don't we let them uh, have any, make any comments and then we'll move on. So Rit, why don't you I, go ahead? Thanks, I just wanted to make the observation, first of all, say thanks to, to Craig for the great crash mapper um, stuff. Um, but uh, related to this topic, two observations. One, in the discussion about Chick-fil-A, there were a number of observations made about the overall street profile of Third Avenue, um, and particularly about how narrow the sidewalk is on Third Avenue uh, compared to the, the pedestrian traffic that we see there. Um, I, I believe that the community board to our south, which I think is five, right? I, I get some of the numbers confused, or is it six? Um, has six, been six, six, six. Thank you. Has been exploring a a vision for uh, a reprofiling of Third Avenue in I think the 20s, 30s, and maybe up to 42nd Street. Um, and I wonder whether there's something for us to be thinking about. Obviously, 42nd Street doesn't connect to us, but it would be logical to think similarly about the way we think about the whole corridor of Third Avenue, and whether it's only about Third Avenue in that particular proposal. Or more generally, I think the concept of protected bike lanes should be thought about, as Valerie pointed out, in terms of the overall cross section of the street and the wisest and, and best allocation of that uh, cross section. Okay. Thank Can you. we just Thank let you. Paul speak again? Because I think if I'm not mistaken, I was reading about that proposal and that Paul was actually involved in that Third Avenue proposal down in Community Board 6. Thank you very much, Craig. Yes, indeed. Um, myself and uh, another gentleman, Barack Friedman, we run a campaign called the New Third Avenue Boulevard. We started the campaign back in April this year. Uh, the genesis was very straightforward. I was on my bike going uptown from somewhere in the, in the 20s, and I had to go all the way across to First Avenue. I was on Third Avenue to find anything remotely safe. 
or I could have gone to Madison Avenue, which is nice and wide and hasn't got crazy, crazy traffic. So I thought, well, obviously we need a bike lane on Third Avenue, everyone knows that. But then I thought, we need much more than that. We need a boulevard. So the vision is very straightforward. We want to make this a nicer place to live, to visit and to transit through more safely, more efficiently. Double the sidewalks for um, the, the avenue. So you have a lot of space for the restaurants to have their sheds, not in the, in the traffic, which is crazy. It's great to get it done in a short you know, time after the pandemic, but when you think about it properly, you shouldn't have to have waiters walking across a bike lane. You shouldn't have cars that occasionally have just crashed into a shed. So double the sidewalk to have the restaurants right outside the restaurant. Much more space for people with mobility issues, people who can't get around. Our sidewalks are crammed with garbage, trash, uh, scaffolding. It's impossible to get around sometimes, let alone if you're in a wheelchair. To have a busway like the one on 14th Street where the buses have the tickets they can send out with their cameras, mm-hmm. i.e. no cars apart from access. The buses zip across 14th uh, Street in 22 minutes, I think now, not 45 minutes. And you can hear people talk across 14th Street. It's remarkable. We have a a cycle path, which is a safe cycle path. The protected bike lanes that we have right now are great compared to nothing, but not safe. If you ever ride a bike and try and go up one of the avenues or down one of the avenues on first or second, they're probably the best Manhattan has to offer. I wouldn't and don't let my 14 year old kid ride to school 15 blocks on one of them because every two blocks somebody turns across, cuts you off and don't care and they'll kill you or because there are people parked in probably most bike blocks, either deliveries or just people parking their cars, and there's no safe bike lanes, you have to swerve into traffic. So we want to create a different kind of boulevard. And the big progress I can tell you about is we have some support from the elected officials. We have Carlina Rivera, Keith Powers, uh, it's in their districts. Mark Levine mentioned this as one of his two key projects when he ran for borough president in the transportation forum. Uh, We have support of uh, a a lot of people. We've got signatures, I think, since April, uh, 450 signatures. We've been walking up and down the avenue, talking to the businesses. The scale here is 24th to 42nd. We wanted to do the whole of Third Avenue, but people told us wisely not to try and get everything done in one go because it's very hard. In particular, the middle bit between the Upper East Side and where we are uh, is huge business and it's very hard to get that kind of thing changed. But also CB6, uh, your neighboring community board already had a plan underway. They paid Sam Schwartz Engineering a lot of money to do a study on calming the traffic between 26th and 32nd, a smaller part than us. Uh, Otherwise, I think it's a very similar idea and the DOT has taken both on board. So the big news I can share with some of you is that we met with um, the commissioner for the DOT back in October for Manhattan at Pinkar. Colleen was there, I'm with Colleen. And um, you both very kindly promised to give us or or said you'd give to us, I think by the end of next year, a study of how we could come up with what would be the near-term version of what we're talking about, which is obviously a long-term version that takes more work, more capital project work, takes many more years, including, and Colleen, you'll, you'll say if I got wrong, extending the sidewalk, using the tree planters like you have in Broadway, putting a bike lane there as well, and using protection of sheds and, and loading zones or parking, and thereby pushing that out, I think, two lanes into that avenue. The net result of our vision would be taking seven lanes down to two lanes for cars, but this has much less impact on car traffic, but still has significant benefits for everybody concerned, calming the street as well. Hell of a talk, I know, but it's something I'm very passionate about. We want to get this done on the Upper East Side as well. I know Billy, Billy Freeland, who I don't think is here tonight, was, this is a huge part of his plan. Um, and I think it was a, a visionary plan. It was, it's a fantastic plan. It's completely the same as this. I would love this community board, not just to, to sponsor the idea of cross-town bikeways, but change one of the worst, most dangerous traffic uh, sewers in the city. Uh, we had... 180 people die in a certain, that stretch of uh, Third Avenue in a 2019 period, I think, so we're hitting accidents, compared to like 78 in the protected First Avenue. It's hugely more dangerous, but also we want a nicer place to live. I'll stop. Oh, thank you, Paul. Thank, thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Listen, listen. There, we're gonna have two further people speak 
Peter Boric and Alita Camp, and that'll be this. That'll be this it for this subject, uh, because I think we've gone on as Michelle pointed out. We're over three hours into the mission here, and uh, but why don't we, Peter? Why don't you go ahead and and then Alita? Thank you, Chuck. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm in support of shutting down the Central Park Transverse to cars, but I do think that with the amount of protected bike lanes that have been installed in the past, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, the fact that there is no way to get from the east side to the west side or vice versa really is a huge pit, pitfall in the system. Um, I actually, I use city bike almost daily um, and it's, I, I go to the west side, it's, it's quite difficult. And I do think that we should we should take action on this. I understand the point that it's late. Um, this is agenda item number five. I do think we should have this as an uh, you know agenda item number one, possibly in January, um, so we can really come back to this. Um, but it, it, it's sort of you know why do you have all these north south bike lanes? You can get uptown and downtown, but if you can't get cross town, it's sort of for some people it's it's meaningless if you live or live on the east side and work on the west side or vice versa. It's and I actually bike across 72nd Street quite frequently. And when I come back to the east side from the transverse, 72nd and 5th, I shoot out. And it's, it's, it's quite awkward. It's scary, actually, when I shoot out and you're kind of riding towards Madison. And then you get the left turn signal. And I, I don't know where to go. Should I drive close to the park car? Should I drive in the middle? It's, it's quite scary, actually. Um, I, I understand, Valerie, why there are some issues with 72nd Street. But, you know... Um, where there's a will, there's a way. And I think this is something that we should address and we should encourage DOD to look at this again. So that, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Alita, why don't you sum up, take the last word here. I'm not sure I could sum up, but thank you, Chuck. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to th throw in something for pedestrians that talking about bike lanes is great and it makes it safer for the bike riders, but we also need to consider some way of enforcing um, compliance with laws or at least safety for pedestrians. And then the other thing is Gail Brewer has called for some kind of czar for street use. There are so many competing interests for streets that maybe at some point it becomes appropriate or worthwhile looking into that. Someone who could maybe mastermind the concept of the trucks and deliveries that small businesses need, the cars, the bikes, the buses, the pedestrians, um, everyone else who uses the streets. So that's all I have to say. And I don't know if that was a summary, but at least it's a different perspective. <laughs> right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I was going to say, Chuck, maybe in terms of thinking in the future, I don't know if January would make sense to have a discussion. It may just be too soon. We may already yeah. have too much going on, but certainly sometime in the first half of 2021, I think we should revisit this and make this our yeah. headline item. Yeah. I would also suggest um, that I think having read independently about the Third Avenue proposal, that it is something that maybe we want to at least be more aware of, and maybe we could invite Paul to um, actually present on the vision that is being um, considered further south in, in in possibly allow us to be able to have a discussion as to whether we would want to ask for potential potentially something along those lines to be looked at in the future. So maybe that's something yeah. we can sure. also do in the future. Yeah, we'll, we'll try to fit that in as soon as we can because I know January is looking crowded already. In um, February, we're we're coming back to um, to bike registration and license. Right. Yes, <laughs> right. Um, Colleen, who uh, from DOT, who's our liaison person, hanging in here. We appreciate it. Do you, anything oh to report? I, you know, I'm, I'm so glad we're doing this virtually at home. <laughs> <laughs> Any anything to report, Colleen? Yes, um, two things to report on. Um, so my deputy, Jennifer Santina, sent a letter to Will um, this evening about right. our expansion of the neighborhood loading zone um, in CB8. And we would like um, the committee to review the locations and let us know your thoughts and feedback. And if there's any conflict, um, we'll give you a few weeks to do that. Um, so let us know your thoughts on that. It's um, quite a few locations in your district. The other thing is that um, as part of our ongoing efforts to balance various uses and needs of our streets, the New York City Department of Transportation has developed 
a proposal to convert the existing parking regulations on Third Avenue from East 61st Street to East 95th Street to enhance commercial access along the corridor. Um, we observed that a high number of commercial parking violations and the prevalence of double parking in the area. So what we're doing is that we're revising the parking regulations and DOT will seek to increase, increase the turnover of commercial vehicles on high demands. We sent a letter to the community board along with the locations where we wanna increase access to the curve, which will help to improve the overall function of Third Avenue by decreasing double parking, encouraging short-term stays and serving more users throughout the day. So take a look at the locations again and let us know your thoughts and you know feedback on, on the, the um, proposed um, corridor. Thank you, Kelly. We'll, we'll make sure we should make sure all the members of the committee uh, get a copy of you know this letter. Yes, the two letters. I, I, the, the two letters. Yes, please, and let us. And and when I was alluding to new business before, I think these were the items that I was referring to, and I think we probably should actually include these as items on our agenda next month because right. I know you, you sent it out this today, right. obviously not enough time to alert the community and our members even to um, be able to review it and comment on it. So even I, we understand that December 30th deadline that you requested is probably due to the change in administration that's coming up, but we, we really should, um, look at it um, more formally and, and get back to you after that. I understand, yeah. Craig, and I will take that back. I, I totally agree with you 100% on that one. So, Thank you, Colleen. Yeah. Good. So do we, have any, you... do, do we have any other old or new business at this point? You have a hand up from Alita. Oh, no. Oh, no. oh sorry. Yes, go ahead, Alita. <laughs> Just kidding. Thanks a lot. This is a question for Colleen. Because of all the truck uh, double parking, triple parking, has there been any kind of research on the impact of those yearly fines that encompass all of the double parking that trucks like EPS and Fresh Direct do? And if not, is it possible to just see what a difference it might make if they get tickets for double parking individually rather than just a lump sum that gives them free, uh, free wheeling use of the streets of New York? That's all. So that is something that you can check with um, your local precinct for your community board in terms of the numbers of summonses that are issued to trucks double parking. I know they compile that data and it's something that's discussed at traffic stat based on the 28th day period. So okay. I would recommend that you reach out to the CEO of the precinct and ask them for that data. They would have that. But, but I think there's, a, there's another question that, that you're raising that Elite is raising and that's the issue of of making basically a settlement with these big companies where they pay lump sums. That may be the Department of Finance. Uh, that would be finance. That would not be DOT, yeah. Yeah, we'll have to, you know what? Well, that's something we have to look into with the Department of Finance, Alita. Yeah. So why don't, why don't we get some further information on that? And, and DOT is trying to deal with some of these issues by putting these areas aside where they can park and maybe you won't have so many tickets that they get. But that is that is called if that's the stipulated fine pro program, correct? Program, yeah, right, exactly. And we will get some further information on that later. Thank you. Um, You're okay, and thank you, Colleen. Um, I think we're ready to adjourn unless someone else would like to. Oh, you have two other hands up. One from oh, Andrew we have two fine other hands. Okay, Valerie Andrew Mason. Fine. Sorry. Uh, okay, so Andrew. Thanks, uh, Jack. Um, I think I'm on. Yeah. Uh, in terms of new business, I just wanted to ask that uh, the spaces in front of 211, 213, and 215 East 83rd Street, which was the former um, St. Elizabeth's Catholic Church uh, of Hungary, which was, uh, um, I guess, announced for closure in 2014 closed on August 1st of 2015 and deconsecrated, I think that's a term, in 2017, there is about 80 feet of frontage in front of those three buildings, which has been uh, no parking any time uh, for uh, 
<laughs> so to speak. Uh, but uh, it's no longer a functioning church. It no longer uh, requires that um, exclusion of parking. I'm sorry, that's my indicator that there's crime happening. Uh, uh, so I just ask that the community board uh, consider uh, resolving to change that 80 feet of uh, space between 211 and 215 East 83rd Street, north side of 83rd between 2nd and 3rd in front of the Roman Catholic uh, former Elizabeth of Hungary Church to regular alternate side parking, please. Hi, Thank Andrew. It's, it's Colleen, and we'll be more than happy to make those changes. We'll confirm that the church no longer is operating. And once this uh, CB sends us a letter, we'll, we can do that. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. I hope the CB follows up and four more spots and we're going to need them. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. You're welcome. <laughs> do we want to do we want a quick resolution on that at this point? I think a letter is fine. All right. So we'll get we'll get you a letter. Yeah, no need for a resolution. Okay. Valerie uh, had something. Go ahead, Valerie. Uh, just quickly, Colleen, I sent you a follow-up letter about the corner of 72nd and 3rd today. Um, can you just take a look at that and get back to me? Yes, but, definitely. I, I saw, I glanced at your email. I was out in the field. That's but, okay. Um, that's okay. I just want to make sure you got it. Yeah, I'll and, talk to and, Danny tomorrow. I'll talk yeah, to Danny tomorrow and I'll get some observation. Have you walked that quarter to see about any changes? Has it improved a bit or... Well, the, um, the corner looks better. The only feedback I'm getting from the community is that we need some signage to let people know that the lights have been reversed because now we're having a problem with people thinking that they were the okay. way they were before. So if we could have some signage up there, that would be helpful. Okay, great. I'll, I will too, provide that to Danny. On a, and thank you again for coming out. On, but on a related topic, when we're talking about these cars, these trucks double parking, not only are they double parking now, but they're coming with additional pylons mm -hmm. to take up even more of the street. So they have a loading zone behind their truck. And so they're now only parking illegally. And then they have the gall to put down these, these pylons. I mean, I don't want to see their workers get hit, hit, but they have no right to do that. Yeah. It's crazy. And nobody is doing anything about it. And and they're and they're double parking in the crosswalks now. And the trucks, they're unloading in the crosswalks and their trucks are blocking the the crosswalk lights. Mm -hmm. And I had a guy and I told a guy to move his truck the other day on Madison Avenue. And he told me, lady, what'd you do before we had the countdown? I said, Well, at least I could see the light. <laughs> like you can't see anything. So yeah. it's, it's a real problem and it's getting worse. And I think we're going back to enforcement. So I'll be quiet and say, have a good night, everyone. Well, <laughs> I have to so say everyone, I, I, just, I saw Valerie in action on our site visit. So you don't want to mess with Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, by the way, one thing Will found doing his usual good work that in October of 2016, the transportation committee passed a resolution calling for a stop sign and a crosswalk at Cherokee and 78th Street, 78th and some other kind of traffic, right? Michelle was right on. And so we'll uh, follow that up with the, with the resolution with either seconding that or, or reinforcing that, uh, et cetera. And we'll have something by the full board. So okay, I think great. we are- You know what? I will check to see if we provided a response. It's possible that at the time when we looked at it, it wasn't feasible. And due to the fact that traffic conditions and patterns change, and the fact and the, the um, again that another request was submitted, we we will evaluate that. All right, take and a look at that. that. Good, great. So um, okay, so we are adjourned, I believe. Okay, thank you, Thanks. everyone. Usual robust discussion. See you at the floor.